the smart cities and service improvements committee. Uh, I'm Sam McCardle, I'm here with Deb Davis, and I know we're just one short of a quorum at this point. Uh, so I believe we'll proceed until, hopefully, I believe Councilmember Jimenez may be on his way, and when he arrives then we'll be able to take actions of various kinds. Um, so, uh, Kip, would you like to start? Or Dolan, or Anjali? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager. I will turn it straight over to Dolan. Okay, great. <laughs> good idea. Thanks, Kip. Um, good afternoon, Honorable Mayor, Council, and Committee Member, Deb Davis. <laughs> <laughs> Me members of the public and city staff, Dolan Beckel here, director of the Office of Civic Innovation. I'm joined and also joined in the front, front box by Regine Nair, who's going to later on introduce the cast of characters that we have, but so you won't forget names, we'll introduce them later. Um, today's report is going to highlight how the city is successful, successfully iterating to improve, both in the way we plan and manage our smart city projects and how we deliver at scale. This is impressive given the number of descriptions uh, of these projects that include the first or the largest. During the first of our four reports, the Smart City Roadmap Update, Regine will highlight the growth in the number of high priority smart city projects and equally if not more important and uh, encouraging, she'll report on the increase in the number of projects trending to green. And as we know, it's not easy being green. <laughs> <laughs> We're we are also refining our approach for the Small Wonders projects, those lighter lift projects that get us ready for the future to deliver both operational efficiency and community benefit and better align innovation training with those Small Wonders. Um, in line with the committee's request for infotainment, we'll also provide a case study and a demonstration <laughs> of, we forgot last year already, didn't we? Yes, <laughs> for, for infotainment, we'll be providing a case study and a demonstration of one of last year's Small Wonders projects that is being taken to scale, the wage compliant management tool, wage compliance management tool. Uh, the remaining three reports here on the agenda will focus on the successful execution at scale of three recommendations from the broadband and digital inclusion strategy um, council approved in 2017. The first being the scaling of San Jose's ability to deliver the small cell permitting speed and predictability necessary to improve connectivity for everyone while making the city more digitally inclusive. The second, the development of a citywide policy for privacy to safeguard and protect the public's trust while adopting technologies. And third, opportunistically pursuing Wi-Fi projects to allow digitally underserved communities to gain the knowledge and opportunity of the internet, in this case, the scaling of Access Eastside to the second high school attendance area, Overfelt, for both student and non-student households. So that's our agenda for today and the major theme of Iterate to Improve and Delivering at Scale. Now I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Smart City Manager, Regine Nair. Thank you, Dolan. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor, Council Member Davis. And uh, members of the committee, I mean, members of the public, my name is Regine Nair, Smart City Manager. So just a brief recap, uh, we presented to the committee and members of the public uh, in back in March of 2019, the approved Smart City Roadmap that showed a total of 38 high priority projects that are active and it essentially created our baseline. So also in the spring, uh, we shared with the committee and public the next wave of projects that could potentially be added to the next roadmap update, essentially our backlog list. However, before these projects are ready to be on the roadmap, they needed to have an approved budget, dedicated team, and assigned contract if required. The projects that you see here on the slide that are shaded gray and outlined in dashed lines, uh, those have been confirmed as active and ready to move over to be uh, tracked. And the projects that are not shaded, we're still waiting confirmation on the staffing or budget. Um, so in the future, I'm gonna use this list as a way to keep track of our future workload. Mm. So for the month of September, uh, the exciting news, we have 49 active projects. So that is a 30% increase, which is great. And uh, we continue to uh, make great strides in moving towards a direction of green in executing these projects. So the four projects that are circled on the slide uh, are the ones that have a change in status. Uh, integrated permitting system and development transformation 
uh, that has moved from red to yellow. Data strategy, uh, that moved from green to red. And cybersecurity work plan, that moved from green to yellow. And community Wi-Fi strategy, that moved from yellow to green. And so in the next few slides, I'll uh, provide more details as to the corrective course of actions uh, that are being taken and currently in progress for those projects that are red status or have changed from red status. So what you see on the slide, the bar charts, it's really a great perspective to show our performance and how we've been trending over the past few months. Again, it validates how we are making incremental progress towards a positive direction. Also, what's exciting is more and more departments are appreciating the value of using this traffic light status approach just simply for its, for its simplicity and then also for communicating um, uh, the progress of all your projects. So for the month of September, again, um, uh, as I stated earlier, we've uh, increased to 30%. And the good news, we're over 60% trending green. So that's, uh, that is great. And then also, we're about quarter percent in yellow and about 10 to 12 with red and uh, w that one project that's on hold. So, and, and just keeping track of all the projects that have changed in status or that will be removed from the roadmap, I'm gonna keep track in the right-hand portion of the slide just for re future reference. So let's take a closer look on the progress that's being made on the projects that are red or have turned, uh, have changed from red. So my San Jose, my San Jose, excuse me, uh, the team has been making great progress in hiring critical staff to keep the project moving forward. In addition, the team is working on an interim solution for language translation. Uh, so now that finance is fully staffed, uh, the San Jose team has been able to collaborate with finance in order to move forward with the RFP process. Um, however, this project will remain red until that RFP is issued. Data strategy. Uh, as we mentioned before in previous committee meetings, uh, we've been unsuccessful in recruiting a chief data officer, um, mainly due to inability of competing with uh, financially um, with our surrounding private you know, market forces. Uh, we did work with Fuse Fellow to find a chief data of, um, fellow. However, that uh, came short, unfortunately. And, uh, and that was also partly due to the lack of competition that's out there in this uh, new field of data analytics. So our approach will be to focus on strengthening the skill sets of our internal talent and uh, grow a centralized uh, data analytics team. Um, so we, uh, right now, we are still moving forward and continuing with our Bloomberg certification. So the IT, uh, the information technology infrastructure modernization, uh, finance has been working with the vendor to obtain the proper documentation for uh, the contracts. However, due to the priority to deliver the cybersecurity uh, and uh, the um, integrated permitting system RFPs, finance focused uh, their staff at that time um, to completing the procurements of those two projects. Um, so, and this one also is uh, dependent upon the citywide open data environment project to be completed first before this can be finalized. So the good news on this one, the citywide open uh, data environment uh, project, finance has been able to finalize all the terms and conditions with the vendor, and uh, they anticipate this to be completed by September 2018, or end of this month. Access Eastside, you'll get a preview of this later in today's meeting, um, but just a high level. Um, the city and the uh, uh, Eastside Union High School District um, we uh, were able to meet with the staff uh, back in May to move forward to the next phase uh, at Overfelt High School. Um, and Eastside Union High School District um, has uh, committed to provide funding for the design, installation, and also three years of maintenance. Uh, they, uh, so you also learn more. Eastside Union High School District com uh, completed an educational uh, assessment, and so we'll learn more about their findings today. And then it has been taking a little bit longer in uh, working, um, uh, in coming up with an evaluation for the technical assessments, but we've been collaborating very closely with Silicon Valley Talent Partnership, PayPal, and SmartWave. 
and um, we will share some of the findings that we've received today um, about the reliability of the network. Um, so, and then also we will be going to council in October uh, to approve a, a smart wave to move forward with the implementation of the um, community Wi-Fi at Overfeld. So the integrated permitting system, this moved from red to yellow. And as you recall, in June, the team uh, went to council to seek a approval to rescope uh, the existing contract. Um, so they have been moving forward in implementing the contract items specifically for the Amanda 7 upgrade. So as we continue to implement our big rocks, uh, we recognize the importance in creating a separate pipeline for our small wonders, which allows the city to get ready for the future. As you all recall, uh, these projects were meant to be time box and they need to be completed within a year. Uh, so these next few slides, I wanted to share the progress we made in developing the Small Wonder Program. So a path forward, we recognize that there are actually two categories uh, under the Small Wonders. And uh, what we've seen last year, um, it, it, the projects that were implemented, they, they focus primarily on the educational uh, efficiencies within the departments. Um, however, we recognize improving our services and internal processes, along with adding the community benefit challenges, will allow us to provide a greater impact to our community and provide also a structured approach in soliciting solutions from our outside vendors. So here's a closer look uh, on the types of operational efficiencies, small wonder projects we did last year. So the city partnered with uh, Startup and Residence, or STIR, in a pilot program that uh, gives an opportunity for governments to connect with uh, tech to help work on uh, civic issues. Um, in addition, uh, what was really great about utilizing STIR was that it provided the city a turnkey solution in expediting the RFP process, the procurement process. Um, up front, where it gives the city the opportunity to select a tech firm and then work on a, a, an idea within a 16-week period at no cost to the city. And then if uh, the minimum viable product is deemed successful, the city can enter directly into a contract. So last year, the city of San Jose was one of 22 agencies that was part of the cohort uh, with STIR. And um, a huge, huge thanks, which are the uh, four teams that were on the slide. Uh, th there were two teams from Housing Department, one from Office of Emergency Management, um, and then, uh, well, the Housing and Office of Emergency Management was combined, uh, Office of Economic Development and Public Works, which you will hear later today in this presentation. Um, these four teams were instrumental um, because they were able to enter into four separate contracts uh, through STIR. So huge thanks. So the so things that we learned from this, uh, uh, just going through working with startup and residents, is we re really recognize the benefit of having the RFP up front, uh, as opposed to our current process, which is utilizing the demonstration uh, policy or a typical uh, pilot RFP. Um, STIR was a tremendous supporter on agile um, um, just methodologies and so uh, we had the great fortune of utilizing our own agile coach, uh, Alvina Nishimoto, uh, who has been a great um, supporter for all the teams. And actually just a sidebar, one of the tech companies that was part of Startup and Residence who's been a veteran, um, they were blown away that they were working with an agency that actually had an agile coach. So mm, it just adds value um, to keep that moving forward. Um, and then another lesson we learned is that some of the solutions that we proposed in this uh, startup and residence may have had an opportunity to be you know, utilized in another civic challenge. So for example, it was the street banner program. We wanted to utilize an online uh, um, uh, invoicing um, platform or uh, service, and that could also have been beneficial for the small cell as well, so something to think about in the future. And uh, due to the wonderful success of the program, um, it really uh, fostered the need to hire a, a small wonders manager, so thank you for 
members of some of the council uh, to approve that budget. And then uh, we're currently in progress in uh, seeking a, a new hire. So the second category of the small wonders is the uh, community benefit challenges. So uh, in June, um, we were we finalized a list of 16 challenges um, that were approved by this committee, and then also we collaborated and, and evaluated through the departments as well. Um, and then uh, the mayor's budget message back in um, uh, earlier this spring allocated $100,000 uh, for matching uh, for these challenges to be engaged with the departments and community to help execute these projects. So internally, we did an initial ranking just to help streamline this list. Um, and uh, what, we, what we used is we um, used these three criteria in order to identify how to prioritize them. And this is a similar process that we utilized for the, the, the big rocks on our smart city roadmap. So uh, the first criteria was uh, impact, which focused on the community benefit operations improvement, and then uh, the efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, the second category was risk, which focused on the opportunity cost or the sustainability or scalability. And then the last was the implementation, which focused on the complexity and uniqueness of these challenges. And then we gave the departments homework, so they had to stack rank this for us to help streamline it so we know uh, what was um, important to ex execute. So the moment of truth, we identified the top five uh, challenges that we'll move forward once we hire our small wonders manager. We need that. So for simplicity in the future, um, what I intend to do is uh, to have all these projects under, uh, identified on one roadmap um, so that it's easier for us to track and report um, in, in the future. Uh, the same rules will apply as the big rocks uh, once we have the budget approved, staff available, um, and if a contract is required, uh, we'll, we'll have to have that all in place before we start tracking it. And then uh, we will continue to utilize the STIR model in implementing these small wonders uh, projects, um, basically through a, um, a five-step process. Um, so the first one was the finalizing the challenges, which we've done to date. Um, and then uh, once we hire the small wonders manager, we'll begin the next four steps, which is the plan, launch, execute, and obviously celebrate and evaluate the, the progress. So, and this is a way that we can ensure that we can deliver this within a year. So I will pass this uh, presentation to Kelly Parmley, who's our Assistant Director of Human Resources to share the exciting progress that HR has made to foster a new generation of innovators. Thank you. Thank you, Gretchen. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Kelly Parmley, Assistant Director for HR. Um, I just wanna make a note here, we've been calling this prior com in conversations and presentations um, an Innovators Academy, and we have uh, changed the name of that to a learning lab, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, so back in the spring, through a couple of conversations with uh, Dolan and Kip, and knowing that HR was championing um, this enterprise-wide priority around Powered by People, um, we had a conversation about how do we support uh, these teams who are doing this work with Small Wonders projects to ensure that it's also an opportunity for them to get professional experience and, and connections to the tech industry to do uh, some training and some development um, and also see it as a value add to our, our employees in terms of engaging in these projects. So it was natural given we had about 15 months now we've been working on Powered by People and was consistent with our philosophy uh, in resurrecting citywide training and development and that we want to nail it before we scale it. So we're gonna do small things around training and development before we try to take things to scale. I have um, borrowed that language clearly from Kip and Rob Lloyd. Um, so, the, so the goal of what's now being called the Innovators Learning Lab, which is trying to convey the sense that rather than have um, a kind of lockstep academy for people to go through, we are gonna attempt to meet folks as their teams are progressing where they're at. So we'll be sort of on demand, uh, meet them where they're at kind of, of training and development. We're also um, in a good position because uh, in the last couple of months we 
turned out a, a request for proposals that now has a very strong list of qualified uh, training and professional and organizational development vendors by which we, in a form of a master agreement, which will allow us to be much more flexible in, in how we get vendors to help us with the training. So essentially, uh, the, the goals of the Learning Lab clearly are to develop a new generation of leaders who are um, thinking about engaged in and champions for innovation, so supporting them in knowledge, skills, and abilities to do that. Um, but also thinking about how innovation means that we have to think about fostering a culture of change um, in, our, in our organization, and that's no small thing as we see by the uh, picture there. Um, many of us have experienced that, and, and trying to overcome that with some professional development and training is, and mentoring, um, particularly from the tech sector, can help us with that. Um, but also, uh, also a, a clear goal is to get us partnered with tech industry um, as well. So just to give you a, a little bit of what this slide is representing, um, if you look across the top, it's the general time frame for a project. Um, we've introduced, and, and as have these folks for some time, the stages of a project. And in order to think about what people may need, we've also added a line in terms of what the recruitment for these teams might look like. And we've agreed to start with folks um, who are non-salaried, uh, or are salaried, excuse me. I hope nobody recorded that. <laughs> They're salaried. <laughs> um, Jennifer Jembry is watching, I think. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> um, so uh, that would sort of give a timeline of when we would select the teams. I think a really important thing and conversation that Kip and I had was um, we had to select smart projects, which we clearly have gone through a real process to do that. And then how do we uh, get smart teams to come along with this? So we're going to use an application process, which we've been talking about, and we'll, we'll launch that with the support of the departments um, to bring some interdepartmental folks to these teams and give them some learning and development opportunities. So along the bottom, you will see what we believe may be some of the activities that we need to engage in in order to support those teams. In the beginning phases, for example, we'll want to actually assess the team's skills and capabilities and do some team building things that will allow them to understand their individual contributions to the team and where there might need to be growth. Uh, certainly charter writing, uh, we learned from the last time, is really important. And at the core of this is project management. Not only how do you do project management, but how do you participate in a culture of project management. Um, and so then we move along to getting a charter and project, um, and then the execution phase, which I'm going to call out in just a second, um, and I probably actually will skip there. I just wanted to call this out because after interviewing and doing what I would call a modest needs assessment with the current STIR projects, this phase is a lot more uh, to it uh, than is necessarily represented by those phases. So you can imagine a team is going to work on actually designing the tool. They're going to have to build it. Testing may not be something everybody knows about and is comfortable with and understands how to do it well and effectively, so teaching folks how to do that. Um, I heard from folks on other teams, like I didn't know exactly what that meant or how I was going to do that, and you can waste a lot of time there. Um, this component on training is one that I don't even know that I have shared directly with the innovation team because it's only happened in the last week or so, but you're going to hear about the wage compliance tool and through a serendipitous conversation, discovered that they needed to deploy this tool, but didn't necessarily have the documentation and technical writing in order to help folks understand how to manage the tool, but also how to deploy it to contractors. So we actually brought in a technical writer just this week to help us figure out how do we document procedures and approaches to managing the tool and deploying it so that we can train on it. Um, so training is clearly a part of this phase, and it hadn't struck me how important it was until I'd done some interviews. Um, and then you can see the rest of the project execution, and then um, certainly the offboarding or, or final phase would be the other part, and teaching folks how do we actually hand things over, how do we bring it to closure, how do we celebrate, all those kinds of things. I think that's my part. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, so now uh, we're going to move to our very uh, infotainment, as Dolan mentioned. Uh, so we'll share one of the four successful projects that was uh, uh, initiated through the STIR program last year. And um, so it, you'll be meeting uh, our public works team and uh, in a, um, InnoActive group as well. So um, basically this project took a year in the making. Um, and, and what, you know, it's something to consider as we double the amount of these pro types of projects. Um, you know, what level of effort that is needed in order to ensure the success um, of it. And uh, so we want, we want to make sure, uh, you want to really take advantage of listening what uh, the effort that these teams have made. So I'm going to pass this to Stephen Dallau, who is the Compliance Specialist for Public Works, and then also Sean Wadidi, who's the CEO of Innovative Group.
Uh, good afternoon, my name is Stephen Delao. I am a contract compliance specialist with the Office of Equality Assurance, our OEA for short. Uh, before we move on to uh, talking about the tool, um, a couple of background points here. Uh, the software solution was first uh, introduced um, in a auditor's report in March of 2017, uh, where a recommendation was made for a software solution to automate the payroll review process. Uh, fast forward to uh, the end of the next summer, um, the STIR program was introduced and we threw our hat into the ring um, and were selected as one of the teams to uh, pilot the program. Um, that kicked off development in the beginning of this year around March and around the same time there were three uh, council priorities um, included or published in which the tool that we're developing is going to play a vital role in, in helping uh, um, achieve. So a little bit about us, uh, the Office of Equality Assurance is, uh, is a group of 10. Uh, there's a division director, a compliance assistant, a compliance uh, coordinator that oversees seven uh, compliance specialists. Uh, we monitor, we've been monitoring prevailing wage for over 30 years and as a group, not all of us, but the group has been around. Uh, prevailing wage basically for, uh, to define what it is, is, is it's a rate of pay that contractors have to pay their workers on public works projects. And the idea behind uh, the prevailing wage requirement was that we had to um, level the playing field when it came to bidding. So we standardized labor costs. On what floor are they serving the lasagna and fettuccine? Oh, that's at, that's at uh, Maggiano's. That was our actually oh, Christmas uh, lunch there. Yeah. We, we all expect invitations. Thank you. <laughs> so onto the team that, that, that worked on the project. Uh, uh, from the office, from OEA, it's Christopher Hickey, the division manager, and myself and Alfonso Duke, both specialists. We have Sean Wahidi and Jordan Guardamani from Interactive Group, and the the actual technical, uh, uh, the the Formverse team, which is uh, the development team, Andrew Andrew and Oscar. So the challenge, uh, we. Today we're, we're monitoring about 130 projects, uh, seven, seven specialists uh, assigned to monitor each group, a, each a group of projects. Um, each uh, specialist is only responsible for the projects that are assigned to them. So what this creates is silos, right? Silos for the documentation um, at each worker's desks or in their file cabinets, and also silos for compliance, right? Because we're not able to see compliance across the compliance uh, requirements across all different projects. So those are the two challenges that we're facing. We're not able to report because all the document or all the data is stored in, in a specialist a file cabinet or in a file on a flat, on a flat, what's considered a flat file or a PDF file. And we can't access unless we can't ask a question about a specific project's compliance status because we'd have to talk to at least seven people to try to, try to get at to, to the person that's responsible for that project. The last one here, and that's what the picture is related to here, is we print everything. Um, and it's for the life of the project from beginning to end. And once the project is completed, we have a requirement to store the, the documents for at least five years. So in this picture here, we had a request for a document, uh, for documentation on a specific project that had already been closed. Now, the process for this is we have to order the, the box to get retrieved from the storage facility, deliver it to our office, cross our fingers that we marked the, the, the box correctly and that they pulled the correct box, get the documents we need, usually last about a couple of weeks, and then we send them back to get stored again. So here's the, pro now let's talk about the process that we, we use uh, to get to where we're at today. Uh, so the first step was interactive. Sean here and his team sat down for 30 minutes with each of the specialists to discuss each of, the, um, each of our roles. They developed the roadmap, and then we started engaging city team, uh, different departments within the group. Specifically, I want to mention out here is the Capital Project Management System team, or CPMS. That's an existing system um, that's utilized by a lot of groups uh, within public works or surrounding public works. And one of the things we wanted to do was definitely lever leverage any existing processes or resources. So in this case, we're going to be pulling all the project data to our tool from CPMS, and we're also going to be pushing back data to CPMS to update tabs, which OEA is already uh, updating manually. So the tool will, will, will do both for us. Uh, once we started testing, 
we introduced the idea of the of the tool to uh, to apprenticeship committees. Sorry, to apprenticeship committees in the area, and the goal of that was to begin selling the idea, basically, uh, or helping with the adoption. Uh, we got their feedback and um, their buy-in, and we used some of their feedback to really make some really good changes to the to the tool. So they definitely appreciated that and told us that you know um, they they were they were a lot more likely to sell this or push their members to use this because we did take the time to listen to them. Uh, we started t testing set of certified payroll reporting process. That's another, uh, another case where we wanted to utilize or leverage existing systems or tools. So we adopted the state's uh, prevailing wage requirement reporting uh, standards. Uh, so if, if, you're, if you're already submitted to the state, you could submit to us in the same way. Uh, next, we're going to roll out beta to a couple of uh, different contractors, um, some union contractors, and a couple of small projects um, to kind of get feedback on, on how, you know, and, and make adjustments to the tool before we do a, a larger rollout. Uh, the benefit for OEA, um, this was actually a, a phrase from, that came out of our interviews, and we are advocates for workers. And what that doesn't mean is that we, don't, we sit at our desk and um, send emails out uh, requesting documentation, uh, following up on requests. Um, what it does mean is that we're out in the field talking to workers, we're educating them about their rights, and we're letting them know that uh, we're here for them um, whenever they have any issues with their wages. For contractors, they're no longer submitting uh, their documentation through email, through a black hole. They don't know if it ever gets received um, or who gets it in the end or if it ever makes it to us. Now they'll have access to a tool where they have immediate um, status updates of what they need to do or where their compliance status stands. For the city, we're, we're, we're reducing the environmental impact of all the printing costs. And because we're building stronger relationships with the workers, we're in turn building stronger community relationships with the individuals that are building the city. So our lessons learned, uh, we have, there was variations among the, the specialist review process which was a good thing because we, we did some of the things the same and there was other things we did differently. Uh, what we did differently is an opportunity to adopt best practices across the group. And so that's what we're gonna take that information and run with. Um, uh, that's the second point there. The third point, uh, we learned that we're gonna use technology to address certain problems that we have now, but it also, um, technology opens up a whole new world of solutions that we didn't consider when we first started. So as long as we have the data, we're able to splice and dice it. Uh, any way we want and use that to uh, innovate more. Uh, next step, we'll uh, roll out to, con we're basically gonna pick a, a date in fall and any project that starts after that date is gonna be using the tool. Uh, we'll continue collecting uh, feedback and we'll build out the certified payroll report functionality. So uh, the last step here, I'm gonna pass it along to Sean to give a quick demo of the tool. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Honorable Mayor, committee members, members of public. Uh, I'm Sean Wahidi, uh, CEO at NO Active Group. Uh, I'm really excited to show you our labor compliance solution. Um, what you'll see in this demonstration is essentially a life cycle of what a project would kind of look like in the system. So we'll start out with actually showing you how easy it is to create um, and activate a project, run through some couple of the workflows to give you a sense of a, an idea, uh, and then I'll just show you the, probably the most important stuff, the data and the outputs that come out of the system. So. Uh, so in this case, we're a system administrator. We're going to go ahead and log in. Um, when we log in, we have a fairly straightforward uh, user interface. Um, so each person obviously has their own access. I'm here as a system administrator. Um, I'm able to go ahead and initiate a project that Stephen mentioned directly from CPMS. Um, so we're using existing, uh, existing databases to uh, prevent double entry. So I'm searching a existing database. That pulls in information already we can easily then uh, assign a compliance specialist to it, um, you know, put the project type, the funding sources, all of which are reportable, and you can see it pulled in information already for that contractor, so we don't even have to input that. So we're now going in and we've added it into our system, and now um, the manager can go ahead and activate that project. So in this case, you just hit the active button, and again, the information's there. And the nice thing here is we put the notice to proceed date, which is an important date for the compliance specialist as their system and their process starts here. 
Um, the nice part now is that compliance specialist is notified. So in the past, there's some miscommunication. There's um, a lot of back and forth between internal even of project start dates. Now everyone knows uh, and everyone's on the same page and has access to the same centralized uh, source of truth. So I'm now a compliance specialist. I have options myself. Um, for today's purposes, we're going to run through a workforce statement, which captures some uh, pretty important information um, for the folks doing work. It will now show me a list of the um, workforce statements available for a contractor. And the good thing to also note here is it's, uh, it's all types of contractors for prime, subs, uh, sub tiers as well. So I, I go ahead and kick it off. And now an email notification also goes to our contractors. Uh, and now they're notified to start their part of the process, right? So they can actually click directly into the form uh, or come into the system, hit action, um, and then uh, they will see the form that's been kicked off. They open the form there, and they're now uh, required to input some information um, for this particular workflow, one of many. Um, so in this case, this is capturing uh, some basic information about the employees uh, and who, if they're a prime or a sub, um, and again, important information like the zip code and the, the craft and classifications. So uh, in the future, we have that data to be able to report uh, out however we want, and then the basic hourly rate as well. Um, so they're just going in there. All the classifications are preloaded to make it simple for them. They're putting in the hourly rate, the signing authority of who actually is entering it. So we have record of it. This is currently done on paper form, uh, format or PDF format. Um, they now submit it to the compliance specialist, who at this point is more in a review state. So in the past, they've had to follow up and say, hey, where are you? We haven't gotten the, the PDF from you. Um, hey, we haven't gotten the paper forms from you. Uh, at this point, they now get an email notification real time. Uh, they're able to take an action just like the contractor did. So in the, in the top there, you can see it says approved and or request changes. Um, in this case, they're gonna go ahead and approve it. And you can see the form kind of just pops up right there. Um, they can put their comment so it's on record as well. So they're gonna go ahead and approve it and they submit it. So now what, right? So now we've, we've gone through the whole work, uh, workflow cycle, everyone's approved it. We now have documentation, but we would kind of want to see that, right? So now let's imagine now we are a project manager at the city here, right? And I want to see the status of my particular project, right? Um, so what we've done is we've taken their existing dashboards of each uh, compliance specialist doing manually, and we've uh, put it all in a centralized manner. So in this case, there's a dashboard accessible, obviously, with the right access. And then each project manager, each compliance specialist, each contractor can see the status of their particular project. So I'm gonna open up this project and you can see uh, the completed uh, labor compliance workforce statement that we just completed. And it shows you what's been started and what hasn't been started. So I now wanna be able to maybe create a PDF of this, right, and have it for my records. I can quickly submit uh, for a PDF request. And at this point, all it does is it sends you a email copy in the PDF format um, that you desire. Um, I should also mention that you're able to export this information out however you'd like. Um, and the other important aspect that um, Steve mentioned is that this is bi-directional, right? So we can now feed it back into existing systems if needed. So in this case, the email real-time arrives, they kick off the PDF, and again, one example of what they're currently doing manually, so hopefully no more boxes. Um, that concludes our uh, demonstration. Thank you. Uh, great. So thanks, Sean. Um, before we get to questions, just kind of wrap this up in a bow. I mean, I think it's important to recognize that um, the whole concept of small wonders and iterate to improve is working. I think it was smart to kind of pilot the small wonders with STIR internally first on operational to, to build confidence in the approach and build confidence in STIR and all five of, I think it's five of our, um, four, excuse me, of our um, initial small wonders pilots are going to scale. Um, and as we're learning that this is now unlocking new opportunities for technology within the departments, um, I think what's equally if not more important is now we have confidence to roll this out to the community benefit. We didn't go through those five community benefit small wonders challenges, but they're focusing on using technology like drones for uh, fire and disaster response. 
uh, using technology to do real-time uh, voice translation at community meetings uh, into Spanish and Vietnamese and other languages. So it, iterating to improve, kind of building on upon our success, now the departments are confident in this approach and confident in taking the small wonders to the next step of visibility to the public by, by those um, top five small wonder community benefit challenges. So that ends our presentation and uh, my probably over elaborate book ending, and we'll turn it over to the committee for questions. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for the presentation. And I really appreciate uh, Dolan's citation of Kermit the Frog in there as well. Uh, really great to see uh, successful uh, implementation of this program. And I, I assume and hope this is going to save a lot of time for a lot of people who are already very busy. So I think that's, that's great to see it uh, happen in real life. Um, one person in the public would like to speak. That's Blair Beekman. Hi, hello, uh, Blair Beekman here. Um, I was interested in you had a, 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 a guide sheet that talked about programs you're trying to talk with the community about, uh, technology programs, and UAV drones was on that list. You talked about uh, how you can talk about drone issues uh, with fire prevention at different community meetings, uh, I, I think I heard you saying and how that can help in the responses uh, within emergency situations. Uh, in that, that sheet was very interesting and it just had the feeling of that kind of that cognitive feeling that was uh, uh, friendly and, and, and learning and knowledgeable and helpful. And I thank you for that. And I'm, in looking at it, I was thinking, how can that, that same work and that same cognitive and funness that that list had how can that be applied to accountability with technology itself? How can, you know, we'll be talking about drone stuff and it'll become more easier to talk about drone use within, you know, pr fire prevention and stuff. Is it from that that it then can become easier to uh, initiate a, a yearly review drone process that was so important when, when the drone was first initiated in San Jose in 2014? That has gone totally by the wayside. No one will touch that with a 10-foot pole about how to, how that how can happen in San Jose. And so I'm hoping what you're talking about now can somehow bring that out so to make it easier to talk about so we can eventually have the accountability uh, review process that I think can be just as, uh, you know, of interest and doesn't have to be a, a, an effort of fear and and uh, recrimination at all. And uh, so good luck in these efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Jimenez? Okay. Um, can we go back to slide? It's 18 on um, Granicus. It's operational efficiencies, lessons learned with the small wonders. Love the demonstration. I just was back here with some questions. Um, you went through it really fast, and I, um, I would like to know, first of all, what is an Agile coach? So, you guys use terms that yeah. I just, you, you gloss over them like everybody should know, and I'm sitting here feeling like, I'm, did I miss something? Did somebody? This is, uh, I think we were probably the only city in North America to have an Agile coach, so. Um, Agile methodology is essentially the belief that uh, rather than taking stuff in a box, spending two years designing it and throwing it back at the customer, that you um, do initial design work, prototype early, and test off and then learn from the data. And so it's, it's, it's in many ways analogous to the, the continuous improvement stuff that Toyota has been doing for many years, but broken down into, into a conceptual model that can be applied to a number of different work streams. And so what Alvina, our Agile coach, does is helps different teams, and we have about 15 different teams that are using these Agile methodologies, methodologies think through how they work through these different problems in this new way of thinking and approaching them, which um, is, is on the one hand fairly intuitive, but it is often extremely different from standard methodologies or waterfall Gantt charts that people are used to. And so she provides um, 
uh, those kind of tough coaching questions that force people to think through it for themselves, come to their own conclusions and apply it in real time as they're learning. Thank you. And is she a San Jose City employee or do we contract out for that? Um, so Alvina and the Agile approach was part of what we agreed with our public-private partnership on the telecoms that if we were going to iterate to improve on our small cell speed and reliability that Agile was probably a good way to do it. So she is actually at, at zero impact to the general fund um, with us as a contractor being supported as part of our um, telecom agreements. And she originally came to us as an Encore fellow, uh, one of the folks, again, trading the billable hour for a bit of the fulfillable hour, had has had a very successful high-tech career and uh, may get stolen away uh, back into high-tech, but is with us for the moment. She's in the audience now as well. <laughs> Hello, thank you. We're all talking about you. Don't, <laughs> don't mind us. <laughs> and then... Um, can you just explain a little bit more the upfront RFP, the first bullet, and how it's different from what we were doing before? Yeah, this is this is a bit of brilliance that the Stir folks have brought in, and, and actually had a conversation with Jay Nath, who's the founder of this, who's thinking about taking this uh, more broadly. Essentially, what we often find um, our demonstration policy is a good one, and it allows us to work pretty rapidly with a with a small firm. So let's say we'd use our existing demonstration policy with, with Sean and his team instead. Uh, we would be able to do the project, but when it came to decide to say, hey, let's scale, we'd then have to go out for a competitive bid process. Um, and the good news on our demonstration policy is we could use the information we'd learned, but we're, we're, we're at the front end of a, of, of a multi-month process. What STIR does is they run the process in the beginning and say, this is the solution that we're looking for. We're going to pilot it, and we may move to scale. So the competitiveness is taken care of in the front end without us making a commit to an absolute scale. So we actually get the best of both worlds. We get a brilliant startup working with us. And if it works, we have the ability to scale. If it doesn't work, we shake hands and go our separate ways, no harm, no foul. OK, great. Thank you. I think that's fantastic. And there's just one other thing um, that you said earlier, and again, this is, might be something I'm, I might have missed, but this is maybe the third time that I've heard that there's a there's a hang up in purchasing. Can you 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 kind of reference something with with staffing and financing um, in finance? Can you flesh that out for us, please? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because I think it came across as a negative and it should be positive. So. Um, a little bit of background. So for the last two years, the procurement team within the finance uh, department has been understaffed. At one point in time, they were 10% of their staffing. Um, so that caused a significant backlog in procurements that uh, was a challenge to, to catch up. Um, so that's where we were two, two years ago. Where we um, uh, recently, the city undertook, within a, a partnership between the Finance Department and Office of Civic Innovation, to undergo a procurement improvement and readiness process to best make some improvements, but also get ready for the additional smart cities tech and uh, that are coming down the pipeline. Um, so where we are now, bottom line, is for the first time in two years, the procurement team is fully staffed. Uh, we just implemented and rolled out a procurement prioritization process where we use some unbiased criteria, not which director yells the loudest, but some criteria about impact and priority to prioritize the backlog, uh, thanks to Alvina. Um, and we are down to evaluating finalists for a consultant to come in and evaluate our end-to-end -end procurement process and organization and technology and provide recommendations on improvements. Um, so that's what, kind of where we are to put the whole procurement um, challenge we've had over the last two years in perspective. Uh, so right now, all the procurements are being worked. Um, now we have to work on increasing the efficiency and effectiveness of procurement. Uh, related to my San Jose 2.0, it had been in the backlog not being worked until a couple months ago. Now it is with procurement and it's actively being worked to finalize scope, to finalize approach, and to get it out on the street. Okay, thank you. And my final comment is, Rajani, I like, really like the, um, the roadmap and the updates that it's very informative. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Councilmember Mendes? Yeah. Yeah, Rajani, I, I agree. It's, it's been really helpful to see that all laid out. Um, the one, <clears throat> bar chart, though, that you displayed 
and I'm sorry to get in the weeds on this, but um, and I know data visualization is, is not my strength suit, strong suit, but it looks like the last, there it is, the last bar is actually a lot more projects or significantly more projects, right? So I wonder, hmm, okay. It's, it's a percent. Okay, they all add up to 100%. I get it now. Okay. So you, I, hope, I hope I added, right? Yeah, yeah no. Yeah, okay. So the good news is not only more on green, but we're actually doing more work. Well, I, I could, depending on your perspective, you just have a lot more tired people. Um, okay, that, that's helpful. Um, with regard to um, the um, uh, Alvina, was she? Does she work in your office, Dolan, or does she? Yeah, she. she yeah, she is um, staffed out of my office, I but see. she collaborates with all the departments uh, as as basically they they see the opportunity to exploit her talents and the Agile approach, they basically engage with us, and so we keep her as busy as we can. Great. Uh, well, thank you for that, and thank you for your willingness to serve, Alvin. I appreciate it. Um, when the, the, the small wonder manager is not yet hired, is that right? He or she's on the that way? Is, that is correct. We're, we're, we're close. Okay. We have, we have, we're down to can with candidates and, and final activities. And you have any sense when someone's on board, when we'd be starting to target the launch of the small wonders? Well, we're, um, if we go to the actual uh, slide, which I think I'm heading in the right direction, Regine, right? Um, I mean, kind of what we're doing is when you talk about burning people out, you know, Regine's going through five procurements with, to get stir, right, last year, and then we just kind of happened behind the scenes and doing the roadmap. Yeah. Um, uh, so as we kind of where we are now is is we've actually started, uh, so we're, we've finalized those challenges, and Regine, as best she can, is trying to keep everything moving and start the planning. We just won't get out of this planning phase until we have uh, some additional horsepower. Okay. So um, you know I, we ex we're hoping that fortunately we are able to. Stir and uh, City Innovate has agreed to work out of cycle. So normally we would have to have had these challenges finalized and planned by September. But Jay Nath is working with us to basically do this out of cycle. So they will they will be ready to support us as soon as we are ready to actually engage them. So we're hoping that's going to be um, you know the October November time frame. Okay, great. <clears throat> so I guess we'll we'll know better when you come back next. Smart City Committee. Yes. Great. Thanks, Dolan. Um, and would there be a requirement, a funding requirement from each department, or how, how is this going to work in terms of funding? Yeah, so um, we're, what we're trying to do is find the intersection of uh, the matching funds that were allocated as part of the June budget message, projects that are funded, and then the actual scope. And I, I think that, and there's some other options which we could also do some fundraising as well. I think, I think the key point here is until we actually have the scope and we've issued the RFP to know the cost, right, we won't 100% know what we're gonna be able to do and not do with the existing funding versus what we're gonna have to do some fundraising for. Okay. Uh, so, I, and no one's expecting a free ride. This is, this is that the departments are gonna be, these are, challenges the departments were interested in pursuing, mm -hmm. that they felt they had funding, maybe not 100%. Right. But at the end of the day, until we come up with the requirements and go through the RFP process through STIR and those startups or medium-sized companies respond, we actually won't be 100% confident on the final cost. Once we're there, then we'll go through that process of, is it four instead of five? Can we fundraise and do all five? And we have to kind of work through, through that process because we simply don't know the total cost yet to do the MVP and to scale. Okay, thanks. And then, and then on the, the chief data strategist, I, I know that that has been an ongoing challenge for us. Uh, I'm sure I got the title wrong. It's chief data architect, chief data. Close enough. Something, yeah. <laughs> chief data, uh, Grand Puba. Yeah. So, do, and, I, and I appreciate mightily the, the, the challenges you face. Um, and I know we've gone through several different iterations. Just in terms of how we move going forward, um, I mean, does this start to look more like a starfish rather than a spider uh, in terms of how we would organize this? Or how, 
how do we how do we move forward in a world where Silicon Valley is going to pay someone four hundred thousand dollars to do that job? Well, I, I think there's a t my thought our current thought is there's a two pronged approach, which is um, uh, given the complexity of this city with both centralized and decentralized IT and data um, and the marketplace that we live in, we probably need to identify someone internally who's the best person that understands the city that we can grow into that direction and also see if we can complement them from, from the outside in, in, the, in the private sector. We have one candidate who we're close, but um, in all fairness, that candidate is taking a potential 50% cut in their payroll and in their salary to come work for the city for the benefit of a better quality of life and lack of travel. And we're still challenged in meeting that compensation scale. Right. So I think, I think it's, it's an and or. Ideally, I think at a minimum, we need to find someone in the city that we can grow into uh, a, a chief data officer. Yeah. Uh, over time, Obviously, and also officer, um, <laughs> and <laughs> the, the royal order of the water buffalo, right? And, uh, <laughs> and also uh, the external uh, external talent that we can bring in as well. So the good news is I think we're closer than we ever have been of someone who wants to make that trade-off that, that comes with 10 years of experience in this area and is the right chemistry and the right fit, but we're still challenged on the, pay, on the compensation. Okay. And the reason why I brought up the starfish spider idea is just that, you know, I just wonder if we may just be beating our heads against a wall here, and I appreciate the challenges, that maybe having a flat, a flatter approach may be something where we are just growing organically the talent we have and paying them for their additional skills and so forth. Um, you know, I just saw that PRNS just launched their prototype map, um, which really it was very impressive at first glance. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to study it closely, but for looking at uh, factors of youth violence, uh, obviously helpful for us in trying to understand where we target our dollars. But clearly that was done by some hardworking city staff, I'm assuming in partnership with other folks maybe too, but clearly we've got the talent around us, and I just wonder if maybe this is several rather than just one person. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, we definitely have the talent and uh, at the delivery level. Uh, it's when you try to integrate that across the city to really maximize the efficiencies is where we, we struggle because there's nine departments and there's the business side that understands the data, there's the IT side that has the data, and all of a sudden you've got 20 entities that you need to corral to, to effectively come up with a single data model for the yeah. city and a single data store for the city. So, um, I get it. So, so yeah, I, th I think that uh, it's, it's kind of like if you look at the pyramid, it's kind of more of the top of the pyramid and the me medium of the pyramid. There's clearly people in PRNS and, and Avi and, and other people that, that get this and can do it, and maybe one of those people have to, have to then grow up into that leadership level. Okay, thank you. Sorry it took so long, but I'm uh, sure it was a lot. You guys just covered. Okay, unless there are other questions, we'll move on to uh, number two. You don't need a motion from us. No. Okay. No. Yeah, so catching up with the slides here, moving on to small cell permitting. Um, so kind of to set expectations for this next topic while the, the team comes up. Um, in keeping with the largest or the first, the city of San Jose is successfully executing on the largest fiber and wireless infrastructure build in the country. Uh, New York is trying to give us a challenge, but as long as I'm here, I'm going to say we are doing the largest infrastructure build <laughs> in, in the country. Um, so the speed and size of this build mandates the city continues to scale our process improvements in permitting and also scale the communication to the public about this build out. So here to provide an update on the city's progress is Jay Guevara, the city's broadband manager in civic innovation, and Matt Lesh, deputy director of public works. Welcome. Thank you, Dolan. Good afternoon, honorable mayor and chair, committee members, members of the public, and the city staff. My name is Jay Guevara, broadband manager for the Office of Civic Innovation. In today's brief presentation, we will provide an update on the timeline, review our deployment numbers, review our process improvements, public engagement, the FCC's recent August 8th decision on health concerns, 
and then identify next steps so we can keep this engine moving forward. When we last presented to the committee in October, we just executed public-private partnerships with AT&T and Verizon, setting a new standard for one of the largest small cell deployments in the nation. In September, marked the, the uh, reaching and execution of those agreements. We quickly initiated a fast pace with a sprint with one of the carriers, permitting 10 permits a week, achieving an 86 permit level to evaluate our processes. Following this past winter, we reached by January performing permitting with a speed and predictability averaging 30 permits a week. And now as of this summer, the small cell team under Matt Lesh's leadership is sustaining 70 or more permit reviews per week balanced across three mobile carriers. So to reprise my uh, venerable sports car analogy from last fall, how did we get there and what, what are we talking about? What gear are we in? So if I may, I'd like to say that in 2017, before we had the resources for the people, processes and technology, we were in first gear. And first gear was basically getting out five permits in a year to respond to market forces. After the public-private partner uh, partnership agreements were signed and executed. We started building that, that team and analyzing how we can improve the process. So second gear, we then doubled the permits, but we did that in a week rather than a year. Finally, third gear, whoa, third gear. I'm fast on the stick shift. Uh, third gear is now, again, 70 permits per week across the three mobile carriers, and we're sustaining that. So now I'd like to turn it over to Deputy Director of Public Works, Matt Lesh. We can describe how we got to third gear and how we are approaching fourth and ultimately fifth gear for this project. To put this in final uh, uh, perspective, third gear at this pace is realizing as of last week, 650 permits. Thanks, Jay. Um, well, I appreciate the compliment. It's under my leadership. Liz Koki, obviously a very happy city employee. Um, our senior <laughs> engineer of our utilities and small cells, she's really the wonderkin behind a lot of the work that we're doing. So I, I appreciate the compliment, but uh, Liz and team and, and Jeff are really great partners in this. And so on our improvements and some of the things we worked on, we'll do some flash screens on some things, but really some of these, we're dealing with some long standing both people, some of our employees, some of our processes are a little old and long in the tooth. and some of our processes systems and really are challenging for us to, to work through. And so in highlighting some of the things we're working on, small cell processes, but I'm also putting in there people and systems. You know, we engineers are, are known for our verbosity. We, um, and J1 and me case sh short on the words. So some of this is really working with our people and trying to think through how to improve these. And to date, a lot of our focus has been on, on to get to permit. How do we get to permit? That's really been a lot of our focus and a lot of the then to come is going to be to get to construction, get through construction and get into maintenance mode. And so that we'll see improvements coming going forward. So we talked a lot about creating a data spatial platform to share the information and I'll show a brief screenshot on that. Um, we committed resources to help them find our information again, get them the information we have so that the carriers can design and get us permits that we can plant review and permit. Then design these construction plans review, go to digital plan review as opposed to just all the paper process, literally shipping p tons of paper back and forth, getting to an electronic plan review process. And then continuing to refocus on retemplatizing these designs so that the carriers don't have to reinvent the wheel on every permit plan, that there's only key components that they need to update each time. Things that are still in the works are areas that we're concentrating on site-specific challenges. We have an old city in a lot of parts. We have things that are different than in others, and so we have very specific challenging areas that come up with a lot of time. So how do we find those ones so we can push through the easy ones quickly and then work on these more challenging areas? Then finally, getting to the site license agreement, because again, looking at the beginning to end, how to get to permits so, so that the carriers are working in the streets. Um, getting that final site license agreement. So again, a paper process can be eliminated and that's in process as well. So to make you scared about all the data that's out there and, and, and help you understand a little bit, the goal here is, so this is our small cell screening tool, which is on the maps gallery um, on our website, publicly available. And what this is meant is really to get 
the carriers to know what we know. So this is all on data layers that they can turn on and off. I turned a whole pile of things on and zoomed out and so it looks scary, like there's lots of stuff. But there's things in there to provide them kind of real information. Things about what our future paving projects are. This year we're paving one seventh of the city, so how are we getting around and maneuvering around that? We have moratoriums that are ending and how do we get around those? There's streets that they can turn on and off so they can plan their work around things that we are already doing. These are layers that they can turn on. So key things here are some colors and some context so you don't have to try to squint at some of these. You know, red means that's probably not available. I mean, we try to make it fairly intuitive. Yellow means someone's probably asked for this. And there's a whole lot of green on there because we have about 65,000 poles. And so there's a whole lot of opportunity if the one that's not really kind of in your, in your game plan, maybe not, we can look for another one. But you also th see things like in the bottom left corner of the picture of things with U, and so you have things that are utilities, or sig uh, they have signal poles. And so things that we, initially we were looking at this, what are we telling them not to ask for because we're gonna say no, so let's just give them all the information. So that's what this was meant to do, is so they could really be in real time. So we're constantly improving our data. We get information of bad information, so we go and update it, and then it's live here in the data set for them to see. And it's pulling from multiple systems. It's not just pulling just from GIS, but it's mostly from our enterprise GIS system. And then going on to another fun one, this is not in the gallery because this is something still in beta mode, just to give you a glimpse of it. Really, it's where we're going and how we are going. This is meant internally for us to kind of figure out where the cells are going, where, and so give us some kind of indication how many are in construction and, and, and so forth, and kind of looking at the broad scope. And these also was to pull off all of that other information. These are just the small cell poles. So there's a lot of other poles in the city that we want to just look, look at the ones that have been reserved, look at the ones that have been assigned. And really this is hopeful in the future to push us to what things are going into construction and the maintenance in the future state. Thank you, Matt. So as we are providing these process improvements and scaling and we're in third gear, we're also learning uh, how our community is responding with one of the largest deployments with 4,200 small cells uh, with one of those maps, maps that Matt provided. There's already 2,500 sites reserved. But I'd like to highlight that really the city has only received under 150 public inquiries expressing any concerns about this process. So at that scale with only receiving 150 inquiries, contrast that with the nearly 8,000 on average complaints that the city receives just on reporting streetlight conditions currently for the, the basic function of the streetlight being on or off. So I just want to put that into scale. Uh, we, we believe that this is due to our transparency and our clarity in the process and our proactive outreach on public engagement for one of the largest uh, uh, deployments in the country. Please don't hesitate to always uh, refer residents and look yourself and your staff to sanjoseca.gov slash small cell, which is the frequently asked questions uh, page that we, we uh, iterate to improve to further refine our clarity, including uh, providing information on the 20 day notification period, how residents may ask and request location changes from the mobile carriers and uh, all the contact information. Thank you. Some of these public engagement improvements not only include iterating on the FAQ that we just reviewed at that URL, but we've also provided flyers to field staff so that they have uh, a hard copy to uh, hand out to residents as construction and inspection is taking place in the field. We've uh, highlighted the 20-day notification requirement, how location requests uh, must be made to the carriers. It is their, their decision under the agreements. And we've, uh, I've personally have provided three different trainings for city council member staff so they have the latest accurate information so that council member staff can also accurately respond to resident concerns with all of this information. Uh, given this, uh, it's right now, it's just myself balancing time and resources, but again, we have one of the largest deployments in the country and we're, we're just below 150 inquiries measured since August of 2018. Finally, I'd like to highlight that any of the concerns that do come through, the city is limited in our control uh, under federal law. The Federal Communications Commission 
preempts all cities from denying any permits due to health concerns. Most recently on August 8th, the FCC released uh, and reasserted that the current radio frequency protections are strong enough uh, that they've had for third generation, for fourth generation, and fifth generation mobile technologies, and they do not plan on modifying that radio frequency uh, limit. I'd like to turn it back over to Matt as we talk about fourth and fifth gear. So one of the challenges we have in getting through some of this data is helping the carriers and their designers get to good permit quality because the faster we get to good permit quality, we can it turn around those reviews and get them to actually permitting in the streets. And so we're working uh, with them and engaging in regular meetings just with their engineering staff, not with anyone marketing or their construction team, just helping making sure that the permitting plans that we get are permittable as we get them. And we're trying to, and we're also maintaining these review counts at 70 a week or more. I think last week was 80 some. And so we're trying to push through as many reviews as we can each week. Um, because we know coming fairly soon, as the, we get 650 permits now, the, all of that work will then be kicking into the streets where we'll have construction problems, which we'll then need to kind of work through those next areas to improve. There'll be the competing interests of, um, all the other CIP projects that are going on, development projects, and our, our paving projects. And so we're working with coordinating across all the different entities. Our teams are outreaching, are helping the carriers to connect to different folks so that we can, again, make sure that our construction is as seamless as possible because it's not just attaching to the pole. There's the trenching that we're bringing in the fiber that connects into those as well. And so there's all these different inter interacting activities that are really going to start booming now on this. So we've been focused a lot on the improvements on the permitting side. Now that we'll be kicking into a lot of what can we improve and continue to improve on the construction side and interaction side in the streets. And I think the only thing I would add on behalf of, of the team is uh, we, we focused here on the discussion of speed and throughput, with both of which are extremely impressive. One of the things that we've been clear on is that at, at no point have we been sacrificing quality or safety. Uh, we haven't changed or lowered our standards. We, have, uh, we haven't uh, done a slapdash process. In fact, the systems that we put in place give us a higher consistency and guarantee on some of those things that we hold safe, uh, hold important, like the public safety and the quality of the construction. So I wanted to just make that clear. As, as we do emphasize the, the, the speed and throughput for the need of the carriers, uh, we continue to also emphasize the safety and the quality for the need of the public. Thanks. And one final comment I, I kind of wish maybe Council Member Jimenez is listening is this is one of those areas where you wouldn't imagine technology uh, intersects with great community benefits. So every one of these uh, 650 small cells that gets permitted generates revenue into the digital inclusion fund to help us connect 50,000 households o over the next 10 years. And so I uh, want to make sure that the team that's working on this, we appreciate all their hard work and effort because it's not only fulfilling to do their job, and there he is, perfect. <laughs> he, he is listening. Uh, it, it also is delivering huge value uh, to, to the community with the first ever you know, digital inclusion fund uh, in the nation, Shireen's brainchild being funded by, imagine these permits and these things that go on the polls. I think another thing to put in perspective is, is that um, from the, from the great job that the team has done with Matt Kano's success on down to Matt is we were approached early on by companies that said, we'll do this for you, but we'll take 35 to 40 percent of your revenue, right? If we'd have done that, we would not be able to make that $1 million digital inclusion grant we're going to be able to make at the end of this year and next mm -hmm. year. So another thing to keep in mind is, is by growing this ourselves, by gr doing it internally, organically, we're actually able to, to, to begin that grant process and start closing those 50,000 households. So I just want to thank the team and let them recognize that we had an option and we could have had 30 to 40 percent less revenue coming in, but I think by uh, funding it with our private public par public private partnerships and having a really committed team, we're going to make a really great impact to the community. Thanks, Don. Yeah, and thanks to everyone who's been working on this, uh, Jay and Matt and Liz and uh, everyone. Clearly, it's a great success so far, and, and we have a lot to be proud of. Uh, uh, Mr. Beekman.
Hi, thank you, uh, Blair Beekman. Uh, yeah, those were nice uh, final words by uh, Dolan Beckel. Uh, I, 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 it's interesting how San Jose is, is kind of, uh, they're asking as a city government that they can have a certain control over how the future of uh, telecommunications will work. And that's it's an interesting way to work. And I, I, I think I'm very thankful that you're working that way yourselves. And uh, yeah, it, it can hopefully be inspiring to other cities, in fact, other, other city governments. And so thank you for that. Um, from that, it, then it comes into my work uh, trying to learn about what can be you know, accountable uh, with technology and you mentioned that you, you have a 20-day uh, uh, period uh, where or a community group can review and uh, protest or whatever they would like with the uh, uh, 5G in their neighborhood. Um, I know we're trying to practice how to be, you know, more focused uh, and everything. I hope that, you, you know, I've been talking about it for a few years now, that you can be respectful of uh, it may take a community group a little bit longer than 20 days to organize themselves, uh, and I hope you can appreciate that and respect that and, and allow an ex extra little bit of a, a lenience time if, if they need it to, to organize. Um, the FCC ideas are, um, you know, shaky to me. I, I am not very comfortable with how the FCC issues these kind of endorsements through the years, and I guess, um, you know, there's always a balance to the issues of health and these health issues, and if, and if community needs to raise these issues, I hope they don't feel afraid that they can raise them, and uh, otherwise, good luck to all of us and how we work together on these issues. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, my colleagues, Councilor Manners. First and foremost, thank you so much for all the work. I, I, I <laughs> We get a lot of calls, or we it seems like we've been getting a lot of calls from residents that have been expressing concern about the implementation and the installation of some of these. Um, so so I, I'm sure you've heard some of it. And, and so what, one of the questions I have is, do you, it seems like some of the information we've been receiving from residents, certainly it, it, it's touching on some of the uh, health impacts or perceived health impacts as it relates to the installation of these things. But they've been coming in form letters as if there, there's some coordination out there. And do we, do we, can you share with us if you have a sense as to what extent the coordination is taking place in the community in which folks are sort of starting to come together to try to defeat some of these installations? Um, we are, I think, what I will say is we are aware that there are other cities um, where community members who are actually residents in other cities are taking to social media and other forms to rally uh, sentiment in the city of San Jose. Um, so uh, otherwise, really our point of contact is Jay picking up the phone and calling people mm -hmm. and talking to them. And there does seem to be quite a bit of disinformation, which is why we've created these FAQs uh, on the website and and uh, and et cetera. So, I mean, to answer your question, yes, okay. uh, there is uh, not going into details, but yeah. there are there are external forces seeking to um, generate some of this the, the the complaints within the city of San Jose, and they are not residents of the city. Okay, I suspect that as much, and I don't think we're in our office are necessarily vetting the emails I've received or, you know, are you a District 2 resident? We just sort of receive the information and, you know, acknowledge the concern. Um, my team has expressed to me that you all have been superb in providing the FAQs and things of that nature and allowing us to, to better respond to folks. So I very much appreciate that. Um, I don't, you know, I, I didn't turn on the TV back there as soon as I should have. So to the extent you've already touched on this, I apologize. <laughs> but uh, what I'm curious about is in the FAQs and the information we're putting out, are we acknowledging the, the and I'm not, I don't know great detail about what the restrictions are per federal law that don't allow us to sort of, uh, you know, stop the process, so to speak. But are, is that acknowledged in the FAQs? Okay, because I haven't asked my team that and I was just curious. Yeah, I mean, sorry, the J Jay was, yeah, the short answer is yes. Yes, okay, well, that's all I was curious. If, if there's anything to add, certainly, but uh, yeah, okay, because I, I think that's, that, that's important for folks to know, and I think that, to me, that's an important driving force that uh, we, we need to acknowledge and make them aware of. But uh, other than that, thank you so much for the work. I appreciate it. Uh, Councilman Davis? No. Okay. I, I, 
Again, sorry to hog with a few questions here, but um, I know there's a lot going on here, and Councilman Jimenez uh, touched on some of it just around the story that's being told. Um, and, and I know that we obviously have no jurisdiction to deny permits on health bases. Uh, on the other hand, the message to residents, if it's, you know, the federal government is forcing us to torture you, that won't be well received. So it, are there any peer-reviewed journal studies that the FCC is citing when they're saying, hey, these are safe? Is there anything we can cite to to be able to tell residents, look, we don't have any control over this, but by the way, the FCC says, you know, here's, here's uh, an article that was printed in JAMA that says that this is safe. Yeah, the short answer just to set, um, so, so Jay doesn't have to take the heat here. Yeah, there, there is. In yeah. fact, the FAQs, the, the FAQs actually cite a number of the sources. Okay. Uh, the the, um, the uh, um, uh, World Health Organization, sorry, I, I'm stuck like De Council Member Davis, sometimes I get in acronyms. The World, mm -hmm. WHO, the World Health Organization yep. has studies and that's published. The American Cancer Society has studies and those are published. Uh, recently, the FCC reached out to the CDC. Uh, and, and other internal organizations and external organizations. So um, yes, there has been research and that is all of those articles are published on the FAQs that the public can look at and, right. and, and d develop their own opinion. Great. Yes, and just to add a little bit further, we, we, you know, we, we recognize the limitations placed on us by the FCC, but as, as we've seen in other areas, if we feel that, that, that something isn't right or isn't good policy, we will make that known. And so we do our best to, to keep current. We read the, the literature that Dolan has cited. We also read information provided from us for those people with concerns and, and, and try to open it, read it with an open mind and understand. And if we felt there was the possibility that we were creating a health risk for our people here in San Jose, regardless of what the FCC limitations, we would bring that to you and, and advocate for a change. And Great. we don't see that, um, uh, but we also do not have the ability to change the permitting based on that regulation. I promise I won't go any further into this rabbit hole, uh, but I, I just wanted to ask one, one additional question because I know it gets raised, which is, I know there's been a lot of studies on telecommunications equipment in the past, but obviously we've got a new species here with um, the small cells, and I don't tend to know whether radiation is greater or less, where the impacts are slightly less or more risky or whatever, can we say there are peer-reviewed studies on this particular set of devices? Um, I think what we can say is, is that Vice Mayor Jones has asked the FCC to do more studies on, as part of the um, uh, California, as part of the League of Cities, to do more studies on, on 5G, however, it's really not that different form of radiation, and okay. it's actually penetrates less uh -huh. than than more. Okay. So there's some inference. That I, there's some inference that I personally agree with that's being done that says this isn't any more. This this is this is more safe uh, than anything that's currently been out there. But I think that in order to uh, represent some of the voice of our community, as I said, Vice Mayor um, uh, Jones has through the California League of Cities, ask the FCC to do specific studies specifically on, on fi the 5G deployments. Okay, thanks, go on. <clears throat> on a related issue, um, you know, I, I know that our political position in Washington and our leadership with the lawsuit against the FCC and so forth has um, tend to cast, I think, some inaccurate views and in some you know, some industry lobbyists obviously have gotten out there and tried to fish for stories for journalists to write. I recall one coming out in Forbes about a year and a half ago, and it's a small piece, and I think Wall Street Journal just came out with one a week or two ago as well, uh, suggesting somehow or another that San Jose is, doesn't quite get it. Um, you know, we know otherwise, and we know what's going on here in terms of how folks are getting spun, but, and particularly by, by industry, but what would be super helpful is if we could uh, with your help, be able to really tell the true story and get the facts out. And so one thing I'd ask is if, you know, if Matt or Jay, if we could get a copy of those slides, that would be very helpful because uh, I can think of a few folks I'd love to send those to so they can understand exactly the work that's being done here, the really good work. The other thing, you know, the FCC is clearly focused, as is Congress, on the shot clock. And I know we're measuring 
our approvals, our permits by month, that, that is 70 a month, which is a great rate. Um, but what we know is relevant to them is how long is it taking to get to success? And as I recall, we're well ahead their shot clock right now. Uh, where, where are we now on that number in terms of number of days for a permit? I don't have our current ones okay. from like the last month or so, but I could certainly we could certainly get those and share them. We, As I recall, it was about half of the shot clock rate uh, last last we checked in. Is that fair to say? I don't know. What's That's an accurate characterization. Last time yeah. we we engaged with with you and your staff. Okay, Mayor. Could could I just ask as we think about actually reporting that number? Because that's what yes, matters yeah. to Congress, yeah. and that's what matters to the FCC. So I think we, the last time we, we looked at the data was averaging 25 days best effort. Yeah. The shot clock mm -hmm. And the shot clock per the FCC for other jurisdictions is 30 days or 60 days. I thought it's it was 60. New. It's 60. 60 days. Yeah, so, so the type of permits. 30 the, days for co-location. Right, right. 60 to, there, it ranges based on the type. Right. But, but for, for the most part, applying to new, new on new equipment, it's 60 days and we're permitting at 25. Right. Okay. So, so we're well ahead. And I, I just think if we were reporting that as our rate and then we were working together and our Shreen's team is working on this, getting those facts out, I think that would be very helpful and strengthening our hand, both in terms of our legislative strategy making sure people know what the facts really are, as well as, um, you know, really addressing what I know is an effort by some industry lobbyists to try to paint us differently in, in the media. Happy to help with that. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I guess the one last question I think had to do. Oh, I won't ask you about the FCC lawsuit. I'll go talk to Ed and the rest of the lawyers about that. Uh, anyway, I just want to thank everybody on the small cell team. I think you've got 17 core staff and a couple dozen more folks who are working in different ways. Really appreciate the hard work everyone's put in here. Okay, let's move on to the uh, to item three, which is the privacy policy update. Mr. Mayor, members of the committee, members of the general public, Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager. I just want to take a moment before we go into, uh, or have our staff go into the privacy report to, to book in the presentation a little bit with a little bit of the global context. Going in to the presentation, let me just say that a comprehensive bespoke approach to privacy is a big lift for any city um, and is work more typically undertaken at the national or even transnational level. I'll come to the, back to this after the presentation with a look at the European efforts around privacy and their implications for implementation here in San Jose. For now, let's turn our attention to Jay and Sarah as they walk through our considerable work on privacy in the last year and give us a sense of what lies ahead. Jay? Thank you, Kip. Good afternoon, Chair, Mayor, committee members, members of the public. Uh, again, my name is Jay Gavar, broadband manager on the Office of Civic Innovation team, and I'm responsible for the development of the privacy policy I'm also joined today uh, with my colleague, uh, Sarah Zarate, Assistant to the City Manager in the City Manager's Office of Administration, Policy, and Intergovernmental Affairs. In our presentation today, we will review the purpose of the privacy policy, review what we've accomplished in the last year with the first phase of establishing privacy principles, then provide updates on how we propose to move from privacy principles to privacy policy in the next year and beyond. This new approach utilizes the dedicated funding for a single dedicated resource to manage the policy process and accomplish this with the necessary tools and processes to effectively implement privacy policy at future stages. So why have a privacy policy? A citywide privacy policy is crucial to safeguard and protect the public's trust as the city increasingly adopts new technologies to better serve our residents. Our purpose for privacy policy is to develop an overarching citywide privacy policy that operationalizes the city's privacy principles and to establish a sustainable privacy governance model. So looking back, Last June, we presented to the Smart Cities and Service Improvements Committee, where we shared the years-long process and results of the proposed privacy principles. 
which form the values that guide our overall development of the privacy policy. The City of San Jose pursued the deliverable of establishing privacy principles based on the Harvard Cyber Law Clinic recommendations from May of 2018. Harvard recommended to start with the privacy principles and ground the process in a three-pronged approach as the city's initial governance model for community engagement. This robust governance model consisted of, one, utilizing an internal working group, two, leveraging external subject matter experts from the industry, nonprofits, and academia with the Privacy Advisory Task Force, and finally, three, engaging the community through a series of periodic public forums conducted separately in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese. We're now reaching the close of the privacy principles deliverable with taking the, this to City Council on September 17th, reaching the close of our initial phase one on this journey to a citywide privacy policy. Later in this presentation, we will share the next phase in our privacy policy journey with deliverables and a work plan to ensure we have the tools and the governance model that we can scale, learn, and sustain across the city. I'd like to turn it over to Sarah. Good afternoon, Chair, Mayor Licardo, committee members, members of the public and city staff. My name is Sarah Sarate, assistant to the city manager. I joined the CMO team for this project this past summer to help the team with policy development and a work plan for phase two of the city's digital privacy policy. As a first step in creating a work plan and to build off the work done by Harvard, we did a city scan to understand what the privacy policy landscape looked like in major cities. In general, most cities do not have an overarching privacy policy or privacy principles. The leaders in this regard are New York City and Seattle, with Chicago providing an interesting set of examples of privacy by design for a major city. By far, the city of Seattle stands out as a leader in operationalizing privacy policy at scale, not just for us, but also for other major cities. Seattle began its work in this area in 2015 and its research in 2014, and has a fully operating privacy policy program. The resources, resources they've invested allow them to conduct hundreds of privacy reviews each year. Their team helps departments navigate privacy risk assessments, legal obligations, and new technology acquisitions. Importantly, Seattle has embedded its work with an equity lens by aligning its program with the city's race and social justice initiative. Considering the breadth, operational scale, and dedication to equity of the Seattle Privacy Program, we consider this model a leading framework for municipal governments. While the City of Seattle provides a model to operationalize an effective privacy policy, there are existing frameworks that can also assist the City in developing a privacy policy. For example, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, another acronym for this afternoon, NIST, under the U.S. Department of Commerce, provides an overarching framework for a standards perspective that we can tailor to our privacy policy using best practices established at the federal level. The NIST privacy framework is based on the prior and successful cybersecurity framework that's fully baked. Uh, it approaches uh, privacy using a risk assessment model. It's designed to be flexible and applicable to be a starting point for any organization in any industry in any field. And finally, it's still in draft form. It's to be completed, expected to be completed at the end of 2019. So it, unlike the cybersecurity framework, the privacy framework is not fully baked yet. While we refine and tailor how to utilize the successful model of the City of Seattle to affect privacy policy at scale, we are also evaluating using the European Union's General Data Privacy Regulations, or GDPR, as a guiding framework to develop privacy policy. The general data privacy regulations are becoming the global standard 
due to how many digital technologies and platforms cross different national boundaries, as, as Kip mentioned earlier, is a transnational effort. And the GDPR is soon becoming the highest bar legislative standard amongst different frameworks. So with this initial research, moving forward, we want to leverage other cities' experiences and lessons learned, but create a product that is unique to San Jose's needs. The development of our privacy policy can be thought of in four different phases. Phase one, which is now complete, was the development of privacy principles. Phase two is the development of privacy policy. Phase three is comprised of the new policies implementation. And phase four entails the continuous evaluation of operationalizing the policy and uh, making the process improvements as they're necessary. As you all know, we currently find ourselves in phase two, which involves creating several deliverables that we will go over momentarily. But before we talk about the what, it's important to contextualize our work around the how. The CMO team believes that the city plays an important role in ensuring the protection of the populations it serves, and especially in ensuring that it neither creates nor perpetuates structural inequities. As we move forward with policy development, we will ground our work in this value and ensure that we include the voices of diverse segments of the population. It is important to note as well that we don't quite know what equity means for the space, specifically for San Jose yet, but this is what we will explore over the next year by working primarily with our community, with our academic partners, with cities using equity lenses in this work, as well as subject matter experts. So now moving on to the what and our deliverables. Phase two deliverables, I'll, I'll read them off and I'd just like to note there's further detail as supplied in the memo for this item. Citywide privacy policy, which is a brief umbrella document. The citywide data retention schedule. The privacy impact assessment toolkit. Training framework for city departments. A master list of sensing technologies a sustainable privacy governance model, and finally, stakeholder engagement for guidance and feedback. This visual can be read from left to right, and we are now in the dark green area with the primary focus to hire a senior privacy policy analyst to own these deliverables and drive the work plan over the next year. So this is a simplified version of the timeline that was attached to the memo uh, submitted to this committee for this item. We've already talked a little bit about the project scoping and our description of the city scan. Additionally, we've also spent some time reaching out to key cities and are in the process of creating a multi-city working group with Seattle and New York City to work through this together. Upon hiring the senior privacy policy analysts, we'll kick into high gear our research and analysis for several of our deliverables, including a sensor techno technology list, retention schedule, governance model, and finalizing an academic partner, while also refining our understanding and framework around privacy impact assessments. Our community engagement will take a two-pronged approach. It will initially focus on our approach that is the tools that we aim to create and how those would inform our privacy policy. And then we'll later pivot to receiving feedback on the tools that are developed. Our goal is to have deliverables before the council by early fall 2020 with an analysis of implementation impacts on the city's operations beginning in the summer of 2020. And with that, we'd be happy to take any questions. And with that, I'll just do a little book ending. Um, so first, I want to say thank you to all of the people who participated in this and the institutions and the individuals, some of whom are here in the audience. Uh, they have uh, questioned and pushed and advocated for these important principles in a way that we hope we have listened to and responded and incorporated and will continue to learn and work together. I want to take a, a, a moment to, to appreciate the good work, but also acknowledge that the fact remains that we are a single city and 
in the absence of a comprehensive federal framework on privacy in alignment with our principles, and though there have been some advances at the state level with the recent uh, CCPA that goes toward addressing some of the data protection issues, we still uh, fall short of having a, a, a larger framework that meets with our recommended principles. So Jay alluded to this a little bit, but where in the world is a model for comprehensive data privacy? Um, one of those places uh, that it seems to be in alignment with our principles and our path is the example of the European model, the GDPR, to throw out the other acronym. And, and I think a little bit of context on this is helpful. You know, my, my, my father was born in, in Nazi Germany, and, and one of the things that GDPR incorporates is the is essentially the effects of the, of the learning from the Second World War and a belief, especially among uh, modern Germans, that, that, that privacy is inherent, uh, inherently a right and that the government uh, is limited in its access, to, its access to the information on individuals. And so you have built into GDPR uh, very, very robust protections around privacy that apply across the entire nation. And so I, I just want to read a couple of things. This is, uh, this is a recent book um, uh, on the Internet of Things for Business. So if you want some fascinating bedtime reading, we've got it. We actually had a chance to sit down with the author of this, um, uh, Saeed Zaim Hussain, who is uh, doing some uh, pro bono work, volunteering with us with ARIS to help us think through our IoT work. But he had this to say uh, in his section that he wrote about GDPR and data privacy. And I'm just going to quote a little bit at length because I think it really does give a good context. Um, Many governments are implementing new regulations that require companies to protect privacy of personal data of individuals in their jurisdictions with material consequences for mishandling such data. These regulations may require consent from individuals, limitation on downstream use and processing of data, or even specify security standards for handling and storage. The most notable of these initiatives is the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, which was adopted by the European U Union and went into effect fully on May 25, 2018. GDPR creates a uniform set of data privacy laws to protect all persons in all member states. Many businesses are choosing to design their products, processes, and systems to meet a single set of privacy requirements and are selecting GDPR as their global standard since it is a stricter set of rules than those in effect in many countries, including the United States. United States. GDPR states that the collection and processing of personal data of EU data subjects is lawful only if it is fair and transparent. GDPR obligates companies to follow privacy by design approach in building their systems and services. And GDPR requires that companies holding and processing personal data take appropriate measures to protect that data. In short, GDPR is very much in line with our privacy policies and might present a framework uh, for us to th as we think about implementation. So any good uh, or any tech company with global aspirations is building a GDP GDPR compliant data approach and tech stack. They just aren't turning on all the features uh, in places like the US where we have not prioritized privacy. So we might begin to consider how we accelerate the process of our privacy development and consider becoming the first city in the country to adopt GDPR as a guide to policy and a framework. We can kind of hitch our efforts on privacy protection to those of an entire continent rather than going it alone. Again, coloring a little bit outside of the lines, but I wanted to kind of shape your thinking a little bit on, on what we're considering because I think one of the biggest risks of doing this right in a single city is that we are alone as a single city. And so how do we make sure that while we do the right things for our citizens, we are also in a position to compel compliance on behalf of the larger tech firms with which we might have to negotiate these very stringent conditions. So with that, I'll conclude our presentation and open to any questions, feedback, and direction which you might have for us. Great, thank you. Uh, two members of the community like to speak, uh, Victor Sin and Claire Beekman. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Victor Sin. I'm the Chair of the Santa Clara Valley Chapter of the ACLU of Northern California. Now that the privacy principles have laid the groundwork to protect privacy and civil liberties in the digital age, I'm glad to see that the work plan has started to address some of the questions of implementation and governance. For the phase two deliverables, in addition to the technical aspects of the deliverables, I encourage the city to factor transparency, accountability, and oversight into these deliverables. 
For example, in the memo, under sustainable privacy governance model, the description reads, and I quote, establishing responsible groups and or individuals who must review new and existing projects using the privacy impact assessment process, along with authorities, unquote. The degree of transparency and accountability will depend on which groups and or who review the assessment data. For example, is the assessment process or the assessment itself, okay, part of an agenda of a public meeting? How will the city work to ensure that, okay, people who are most affected by these tools, for example, immigrants, people of color, communities, um, low-income communities, okay, how will they, okay, be given, okay, ample time and opportunity to influence these policies? For the deliverable master list of sensing technologies, the immediate question, okay, is how often the list will be updated because new te technologies come into existence very often. Or better still, maybe the list, okay, should be equipped with a definition or a high-level description of what constitutes a technology that should be governed by the list. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. That was very nicely said. Um, I, you know, the, the, the privacy policy idea, as I've been understanding, it, it's doing well in what you can do as government to make for good practices for yourselves and to protect ourselves as a community. I think what Victor Sin was trying to offer was how can we develop a way that you can create more engagement with the everyday community? And that's been an incredibly important goal of mine that I feel that what Victor and the ACLU have started, um, they've created a guideline process to really make it safe for, to use the word safe, for, for the public, the everyday public and the community to create a better interchange and exchange with each other. And um, I, I really hope uh, we're learning that uh, you, yourselves as government can trust that and can trust by developing those practices what the community and the public will give back to you. I think it, it will just be phenomenal. And I think we will be developing like really good practices of uh, democracy, uh, you know, that we've been so fearful of all these years that we want to, uh, a republic form of democracy, but I think we can develop real guidelines and systems to develop a real more engaging public to government uh, process. And uh, we have the tools to do that now. And uh, so I really appreciate what Victor has to offer uh, today. And I'm totally in support of, of, of what you can do to, to talk about technology itself uh, more. Uh, and what, what are we going to do in the meantime uh, while we wait for this privacy policy to develop? What are we going to do in the meantime here in San Jose with day-to-day -day issues of openness and transparency? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, back to the panel. Councilor Mendez. Thank you. Um, so I was struck by the um, our approach slide the policy development process will ensure the inclusion of community voices to help guide how and what data is collected and used. And what that brought up for me is something we haven't discussed, which is I appreciate all the discussion about GDPR and, and where, they're, where they're going and that businesses have capabilities, privacy capabilities that they're not turning on in the US, but we have a weird paradox with privacy, a very odd relationship with it in the United States. We, we say we want it and people freak out about um, knowing that their kids' test scores get used in research, for example, but, but then we shrug when we find out that the companies that we use every day and have come to rely on are actually surveilling us on a regular basis and literally listening to our conversations. And that just kind of goes in and out of a news cycle and nobody talks about it. It doesn't become a national discussion. So 
I guess what I want to know is when we're including community and community voices, I think there's an education component there that we're, and part of it is we humans are really bad at evaluating risk, right? And so the, the idea that one of our kids could be that needle in a haystack that gets found is, is more troubling to us than the very real risk of this thing literally listens to my conversations and then feeds me ads based on what I've said rather than what I've typed. So how are we going to structure those conversations so that they are educational and give us actually useful feedback and input? Very, um, one of the observations we've been discussing as well, and I think one of the tools that we think is, uh, gets at the heart of that is, is the discussion a little bit farther on in the piece is when we do the use case by use case. Because I think one of the things that is, we find is hard and was a little bit difficult about some of the, the broader community engagement, not so much with the experts um, who think about this deeply like Victor and others, but with the sort of the broader community was, what are you talking about? What does it mean? And sort of, you can kind of begin to, to, to imagine a lot of things that might not be out there. So part of what we think is that what we need to do is, is, is to be able to figure out a way to meaningfully engage people around the specific use case. And as you say, do some education around that use case, uh, not a sales job, but to, to explain and walk through from the subject matter experts, how is this going to be used? What does it do? What do we currently do? What are the current technologies that are out there that you see every day do and how are they used? So to at least provide some context mm -hmm. so that, that people are certainly feel to, uh, free to have their feelings and express them and we should take them into account, but it, that, that it's not necessarily an overreaction to something that they may be already doing on a daily basis. Right. So it's a tough one, and it, and, it, and it is a very difficult one to, to tease out. And this is why we also reserve the governance function for, for ourselves and the, city, man and the uh, city council to make sure that we're not actually handing over the process of deciding on this or that or the other to uh, whoever happens to show up to a particular community meeting. So it's, it's a balancing act between being open and respectful to those voices and modifying what we hear and making sure that we are aware of the context of, of, of how we use the data and what we use. And I think to Victor's point, making it transparent on who's making those decisions how are those decisions made and making that visible goes a long way towards satisfying um, our, our, what I feel are our obligations to have a, a balanced approach to that. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I don't know to what extent it helps me when I know the back end of, you know, yeah, my data is going to be used, but the chance of anyone, you know, seeing, connecting that data with me is minuscule or basically impossible when we're talking about big data. So putting it in the context of, yeah, we're gonna take this data, whatever it is, your data, but it's you know, millions and millions of records. Anyone ever seeing that one record is never gonna happen. <laughs> because people don't, we don't look at things record by record, right? We, we look at them through analytics and processes as opposed to like we're looking for trends. We need the individuals to, the individual observations to find the trends. I don't know how you explain that to people, but I think that's a key concept. We will take that in, into consideration as we think about the engagement and the education component on that. I think the other thing that, that we should also talk about is the, the, the one-two punch of privacy and, sec and security, right? We have made, thanks to your direction as a council, mayor and council, significant investments in cybersecurity. And so part of, part of this is making sure not only do we have the privacy principles in place, but that we've got the, the cybersecurity in place to, uh, to take uh, the maximum steps we can to assure that there aren't breaches or inappropriate um, uh, releases of those data. I won't, won't go into any of that except in closed session, but, the, but that is a, that, that's the other side of the, the coin of privacy is to make sure that security is, is equally as, um, invested in. I agree with that, and I would add it's not just to external malicious actors, but also to internal malicious actors, which we find 
I think more often and Rob is nodding his head. So yeah, not I, necessarily within the city of San Jose, but that's just what we're finding when people are stealing data. It's because they're on the inside. It's easier to do that. So what are our processes around that is what we're going to have to be really clear on with people. And I'll hand this over to Rob because I know he's itching to say something. Uh, this, is part of, this is part of where the infrastructure refresh becomes important, is to have the ability to, to clearly limit access um, to uh, a small list of credentialed and approved people who need to see that data and need to use that data. Uh, you know, the, the old era of, oh, I've got it on my hard drive, let me stick a thumb drive in and hand you that data, means that you immediately lose control of that and you're trusting the goodwill of people. We have a lot of people with goodwill, but all it takes is one without. Right. And so uh, modern infrastructure data where nobody can take it off on a thumb drive and you have to be credentialed, you have to have a, a separate layer of passwords, uh, really gives us a much more robust environment to, to provide those assurances. Rob? Uh, absolutely. Um, and, and so we're nodding our head over here, Marcelo and I. Um, Marcelo is our Chief Information Security Officer. Um, because you, you've hit exactly the points, is there's a technical build and controls that we need to put in place. Uh, there's also a matter of making sure people know and habituate good behaviors because you can have in one corner millions of dollars of investments and in the other corner one helpful employee who helped a little too much and released something. Um, and so those controls do matter, but also the, the people part of things. And so what I would invite you to consider is, is part of this privacy conversation is there is an information, we kind of imagine three circles that are linked. One is information security, the ability to secure it. One is privacy, is how you should treat it. And the other one is also ethical use, because as we get into AI and, and um, uh, uh, machine learning and the algorithmic basis of decisions, we have to make sure that those treat the community well um, and that this continuing conversation keeps on waving, uh, weaving back into the controls that we put into place. Thank you. Councilman Menes? Trying to follow the conversation. I'm, I'm trying to let it all sink in. <laughs> I do have some more elementary questions, as you'll see. Um, so, so it seems to me that we're looking at Seattle uh, as, a, as a sort of starting point and uh, someone that we seem uh, to think has developed a good framework. Has Seattle adopted GDPR? Because I'm not sure if it was clear. Maybe I missed it, and I apologize if I did. No, they have not. Okay, and if they're the model and they haven't adopted it, is, have there been any discussions as to why? Or Well, so um, far be it from me to disagree with Kip, but um, they, they officially, yeah. they, they, but, uh, but so a number, the cities we have taught, the leading cities we have talked to um, basically are all agreeing that GDPR is the framework that should be followed. Um, because the implementation of GDPR is not yet a requirement within the United States, uh, they're falling short of saying that we're adopting it or we're implementing it. I think what Kip is saying is, is that we could say it's our guiding framework and, and incrementally begin to, to implement it knowing that some things are gonna be harder than others. Mm -hmm. But I think that uh, the cities we have talked to have basically said, yeah, if we, we, GDPR basically is the most advanced, the most thorough, the most rigorous, and the most uh, privacy constrictive of the frameworks that have actually been implemented. And so they're basically saying we're, we're following it, but not saying we're following it. And I think so, for mm -hmm. example, um, a key tenant of GDPR is the privacy impact assessment which is a document that as new technologies come in or you evaluate existing technologies, you understand what's the impact to the consumer or the, 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 the public, what's the impact to operations. You document that, sometimes hundreds of pages, and you publicly make it available uh, in, in a transparent form, either in public forums or on your website. So Seattle's adopted that. New okay. York is going to adopt that. So kind of what we're doing is, is we're, we're incrementally adopting GDPR in the United States because we haven't been told yet to do it. Um, I think my personal preference is we should just jump to the conclusion and say we're gonna adopt GDPR and get on with it uh, and, and go about that process. So I think that um, that's kind of the alteration. No one in the United States is implementing GDPR in the local government setting. They are adopting what they want to adopt from it for right now, such as privacy impact assessments. Okay. Kip, I don't know if you want to respond. I, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> so, thank you for that information. I, 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 one of the things that comes to mind for me as we're discussing, you know, just the, the, 
the, the fact that GDPR hasn't been adopted, and I'm not sure under what framework it would be adopted in the United States generally, and the feds would need to leave that, I assume. But how do we make certain that we don't, uh, in effect, become an island of sorts? Let's just say the, 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 the federal government decided to go a particular direction. And, how, and even though GDPR seems the way to go right now, what if... That's, I think that's a great question. That's part of what we would want to vet out, and that's why I'm certainly not here recommending and say, hey, our recommendation is let's do GDPR. There's a lot of legal implications. There's a lot of technical implications we'd have to work through, what parts of it, framework. Um, I think w we wanted to provoke this kind of discussion because part of what we, part of the yes and that we hope to do is to, is to have a bespoke approach that really does uh, meet the needs of our, our unique uh, community and see where we can leverage some of the larger global trends. So I think that's exactly the kind of question we would want to evaluate and come back to you with kind of a risk analysis. Uh, you know, for example, the, 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 it may not be technically capable for them to turn it on just for the city of San Jose within the context of the United States, certain of the aspects or features. We don't know that until we go deeper in. Um, and so part of what we're testing is sort of the appetite to explore. Okay, and, and the other elementary question I had was, <laughs> is, and this is probably like third grade level here, but is, is, the, is the data in Europe different from the data that we capture here in the United States? I mean, it, it, it's, it's, in my opinion, it's substantially the same. I mean, it's, 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 it's the same set of, as we've talked with counterparts in cities, in fact, um, we'll be talking deeply with counterparts in Dublin uh, coming up here. Uh, they deal with exactly the same sets of issues, the same tools and techniques. So part of what we like about that is it's, it's a very much like for like kind of situation. Okay, all right. So we just plug and play, so to speak, right? It, it, yeah, of course, it's never that simple. Correct, correct, but, but correct. Yeah, that's our hope is that we can, <laughs> we can, we can do our R&D, rip off and duplicate, right? Okay, wonderful. Uh, the, the other question I had is, uh, and, and I think you sort of used some language earlier that made me think about this, and, and, and I know in, in past meetings, I haven't been on this committee too long, but I know uh, we've, and I forget if it's in the big rocks or small wonders, but uh, the, 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 it seems to me we as a city are striving to create these data sets that can then be used, the big data that can then be used to, to create solutions or evaluate and see things in a different manner, which I think is wonderful. Uh, what I'm wondering, and that seems to me to, to to speak to uh, making that data accessible, maybe scrubbed, cleaned, and then you know having it folks plug in, use the data, come up with some solutions. And, and so it, it seems to me that there's some inherent tension between that and privacy, and I'm curious as to how we are gonna sort of balance that out. That, that's exactly the question, right? On the one hand, we wanna be a source of open data and provide open transparency to our processes and what we learn. And on the other hand, we wanna protect the privacy of individuals. And there is a, a natural tension. They're not always in conflict, but there's a natural tension between those. In addition, the additional tension in that sort of rubber band uh, of, of pulls and tugs is utility, right? From a pure utilitarian standpoint, the more data we have on people, the more we can refine it. That's why the council member's phone knows exactly where she wants to go on vacation. But I don't think that our residents really want us to, to refine the services to that extent that we're, we're listening in on their private conversations. And so, yeah, there is, there is a tension between this and what we're trying to do with the privacy principles that, that we're bringing forward, that you all have approved at the council and we're bringing forward for council uh, final approval is to kind of stake our terrain on 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 that tension between usability and individual privacy, um, and 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 where we think the right balance and mix is. Yeah, and is there anything to be said with regards to who's making that determination? Right, is it is it you determining what, how much should be released in the privacy, or should it uniquely be? two separate people, two different departments that maybe have different interests and let them sort of duke it out and develop what's... Yeah, I, I certainly don't want to be the one uh, making all the decisions, <laughs> but I, I think, again, to that point and to the point made by the gentleman from the ACLU, Victor, that you know the, the question of who makes these reviews, who makes these decisions is, is extremely important. And for us, uh, that is a language of governance, right? Ultimately, we get our direction from the mayor and council through the city manager, but what we want to do, like we have with many different functions, I'll use the example we just saw, the, the, the wage compliance, right? We have a team that's dedicated to that with a sense that their job is to advocate for the worker and inform the, uh, the contractor of their rights. We'd want to set up a similar dynamic where you have the right people uh, who are, uh, have the right orientation toward it. So 
that, that suggests two things. One, the development of a clear governance model that's transparent and balances those so it's not just all of one side or the other. And two, previewing, um, we've got Seattle up here, three FDE in 800,000 a year. Uh, these, to do this well is not to be done cheaply. And so that's one of the other things that we need to balance, uh, as you pointed out, as we've talked about other technology investments in line with all the other investments we might make with our limited general funds. And so. We'll come back to you through the process with recommendations on that, and we don't yet have a, a single clear answer. Okay, thank you. The, the other question I had is uh, to the city attorney's office or anyone that wants to chime in, even you, Mayor. But uh, I'm curious how much how mature is the is the the legal field as it relates to digital sort of data and and you know. And the reason I'm asking is I can't help but think that as we're developing this framework, we're essentially developing a framework that folks can utilize then to sue us for violating said framework. And I'm trying to think of how. <laughs> right, our office does have a representative that is working with um, the Office of Innovation in order to do, look at those issues. And there is some tension between a government agency that is supposed to be providing information um, under the Public Records Act um, federal government does it under the FOA, FOIA. Um, but then there's also the tension of keeping uh, private uh, information private. Um, there is under the, the Public Records Act a balancing test that governments have to go through or can go through with regard to balancing the need for privacy and the need for the public to know. Um, and so we know that there's gonna be some issues. Um, there are some guidances that we're looking at. Um, but we do have somebody working with the Office of Innovation to look at those issues. Okay. Thank you very much for answering my questions. Appreciate it. Yeah, and just as an overlay, um, so everything we've talked about, like governance and a data protection officer, are requirements in, in GDPR. Um, it's been implemented for a year in Europe now, so I'm going to be actually spending two full days with the city of Dublin and their uh, uh, chief data um, protection officer to understand what's worked, what hasn't, what they would change, and we'll be able to bring those back. And we're going to be doing that actually in about four weeks. So that'll help us understand how we might customize that and make it our own, but leverage all the best practices and key learnings from GDPR in Europe. And how to spend that? I know that we're uh, running uh, low on time. I'm going to lose a quorum very shortly. So rather than uh, maybe engaging, maybe I'll just be happy to take your responses offline. I just wanted to offer my two cents as the least knowledgeable person probably in the chambers about privacy policies. I, I just wanted to make a pitch that we adopt an agile approach, to borrow uh, Kip's word, to the, the crafting of this policy. Because I am fairly certain whether we spend 10 hours, 10 months, or 10 years on this, we're absolutely gonna get it wrong the first time around. Um, and it's gonna require a lot of iteration and a lot of community feedback. And the most meaningful community feedback will probably be after our draft is done, not before, because people, we need something for people to react to and respond to, and it's very abstract otherwise. Particularly as we're going to communities that may not be uh, as digitally savvy. Uh, I think it's really important for us to have something for people to respond to, and we can hit, take meaning, more meaningful feedback. So I just wanted to, suggest that, you know, I, I'm concerned. I know we've been, uh, we, we've done a lot of good work to get to this point. We've created, I think, good uh, privacy principles. I think they're very solid. And I know we've done a lot of community feedback or community outreach, and we're gonna do more, and particularly in three languages, and I think that's all great. Um, I'd hate to see us do too much wheel spinning in the hope of getting to a perfect product that we're just never gonna get to, particularly in a field that's evolving so quickly and the technology's evolving. And let's face it, a lot of other folks have been spinning their wheels doing this work too. Uh, I'm perfectly happy taking a, an off-the-shelf solution from Seattle, for example. Let's adapt it slightly, let's get it out there, and let's just agree we're gonna modify it every six months as we learn and, and really uh, accept that this is gonna be a learning effort for, for the whole city. So uh, really appreciate all the work that's gotten us here. I just hate to think we're gonna spend too much time and energy trying to get this perfect the first time. But thank you all. Uh, okay, so we're, uh, we're on to the final item, which is an important partnership that we have with Eastside Union High School District. Yeah, so as, uh, as we're making the transition here in yet another first, uh, the Access Eastside project is the largest public center intervention in the country to provide free outdoor Wi-Fi to underserved communities. 
this project targets both student households and non-student households in the three most digitally underserved areas in East San Jose, that being the James Lick High School area, the William Overfelt High School area, and the Yerba Buena High School area. Um, Access Eastside is now fully deployed to the James Lick students and non-student households. We have an educational performance baseline to measure and compare, and we have technical performance metrics to, uh, to discuss today. We're excited that on October 1st, we're planning to bring to council approval to move on to implement Access Eastside in the Overfelt High School area. Mm -hmm. And while Regine will be delivering the presentation, joining us uh, in, the, in, the, in the front and back box to answer any questions, is uh, Randy Phelps, the Chief Technology Officer from Eastside Union High School District. Um, Michelle Ornett from the Library Department joining us in the back box. We have Al Brown from SmartWave, the Systems Integrator, and um, Rob Lloyd, and I guess Michelle somehow migrated from the front box to the back box, so Michelle's back there. <laughs> so, Regine, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Dolan, and uh, good afternoon again. Uh, so before I begin, I, I wanted to share some background about uh, the effort that has been done to date on this whole uh, project. Um, it, it was uh, sparked by Eastside Union High School District where they passed a, a technology bond back in 2014 um, to ensure how the students can have access to both the computers and uh, modern technology. Uh, they explored several <laughs> options to leverage bond for digital inclusion, and uh, this is where a city had an opportunity to really collaborate further with them in uh, establishing our very first pilot, which was the Community Wireless Network, um, and now we're rebranding that to uh, Access Eastside for future reference. Um, and then to date, where the city and uh, the uh, Eastside Union High School District, we were able to provide community Wi-Fi access to a total of about 6,000, which includes the students and the teachers um, at James Lick attendance area, and that we opened up in, back in October 2017, and then also the surrounding non-student households within that attendance area back in March 2019, respectively. So just to, to uh, focus on the, the key outcomes that we wanted to achieve for this Access Eastside project is that we wanted to provide free uh, internet access for all the students, teachers, and the community within um, the three attendance areas. Um, also- Rajani, I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to stop you for a moment. Uh, I'm gonna ask if uh, there are any council members within the earshot they could come out and join us. <laughs> Apparently, uh, it's not just my own emotional needs to have council Technically, members, there is no hearing when you only have one <laughs> member of the committee. <laughs> Thank I, won't, you. I won't take that personally, Ed, but, <laughs> but I'm gonna go see if I can fetch somebody. I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> we have a hearing. <laughs> you saved the day. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Because we had a stellar audience here. So, um, it's quality, so, not quantity. Uh, yes. All right. Uh, so let me just do a quick recap on that. Uh, the wireless outcomes. We, uh, the goal of this particular project was to provide uh, free Wi-Fi access to the students, the teachers, and the surrounding community members within that attendance area. And the three high school uh, focused were James Lick, Overfelt, and Ebra Buena. Uh, so in, uh, the, th the second one was uh, advancing the students' academ uh, academic achievement uh, through an internet-based learning uh, using all these technologies. And then finally, uh, providing opportunities for these students uh, just for um, gaining access uh, for career opportunities and college resources. So the scope of work for this specific project uh, was uh, to provide the uh, free uh, outdoor Wi-Fi um, in addition to LTE hotspots uh, through a partnership that uh, Eastside Union uh, High School District was able to achieve through Sprint. Um, then also uh, provide uh, community Wi-Fi access again uh, with all the students in the three attendance areas uh, that you see in this map, James Lick, Urban Buena, and uh, Overfeld. Um, and also the non-student households. 
Uh, this was absolutely the most innovative partnership that uh, in city's history um, in collaboration with the Eastside Union High School District where uh, the district was providing the funds uh, for the design installation and the maintenance um, and also the administrative um, efforts. Uh, whereas the city was able to leverage their assets and uh, provide support for the implementation design in collaboration with our partner, SmartWave, which we have here as well. So uh, this is the known largest, uh, largest known public sector in intervention in digital inclusion. So what I mean by the largest, it literally took a village to really build this. Um, so you can see here all the various partners that we had um, in collaboration. And with the city alone, uh, we had the Department of Public Works. Uh, we also had I, uh, Information Technology Department, the library, uh, Department of Transportation. Um, so that alone was huge. Um, in conjunction with uh, the uh, PG&E to help us with understanding our assets better, uh, and Cupertino Electric and Rosedon, who were the actual contractors that were installing these uh, devices, um, and then our partnership with SmartWave Technologies. And our recent uh, collaboration is with uh, Silicon Valley Talent Partnership, which is part of the joint venture of Silicon Valley, and uh, they partnered with PayPal to help us with a lot of the technical um, capability findings. So what we found just recently with our partnership with Silicon Valley Talent and Partnership and PayPal um, is that uh, they were able to un um, understand the data that has been collecting um, um, since the implementation of all the, all the Wi-Fi. Um, and Basically, this is averaging about 1.5 or 1.5 terabytes of data being transferred on a monthly basis. Um, and then uh, since April, when we opened it up to the community, um, we noticed that it was about 5 terabytes um, that were being transferred on a monthly basis. And just to kind of assess that amount of data, that is a combination of downtown, uh, the airport, and our convention center. So this is a crazy amount of data. Oh, and it was five times greater, sorry, five times greater, thank you, thank you, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, also what we were able to find in a preliminary level is uh, that um, the reliability of the service was um, about 99.4 percent, so which is pretty uh, reliable. Um, and then uh, what we're understanding with this design that SmartWave utilized, this mesh network, it really was a cost-effective way in order to provide that connectivity and reliability. So this was uh, actually inspired by Dolan, and uh, um, you know, because both of us are geeky, uh, we're engineers, so we love to really assess how, what does really a terabyte mean. Uh, so this is some fun facts that uh, I was able to figure. Um, so one terabyte, about 200,000 songs uh, that are five minutes. 10 terabytes is what the total amount of data that the Hubble Space Telescope collects. And, and then also, uh, just if you're a YouTuber, 24 terabytes of data uh, that was uploaded in one day in 2016. I'm sure now it's a lot bigger. And then just to kind of translate that into um, something more environmentally conscientious, uh, one terabyte equals about 50,000 trees uh, that's transferred into paper. And then uh, the, this last one I found interesting was 10 terabytes is our whole entire Library of Congress with the printed documents. So something you want to use on Jeopardy one day. Uh, so with the <laughs> community wireless um, educational outcomes, I'm going to give this one to Randy because he, he deserves the credit on this effort. Right. And before I hit that, I want to just clarify the, the slide before when it said uh, the data that's passed on the community side in James Lick is five times greater than what we did downtown and the airport. That's the distinction. So the, the, we, we went about this a little bit differently uh, for our community, and our community really, really, really uses this data, and it's very, very valuable to them, where at the airport you have people who actually have their own plans and things like that. So for us, 71% of our 2018 graduates matriculated to a two-year college or a four-year university. And of course, Eastside's part of the uh, San Jose Promise. 
which is a fantastic program that allows our students to get into San Jose, uh, provided they do a, a, an A to G curriculum. In other words, if they take rigorous classes, they automatically get admission to San Jose State, which is great. 11% increase in SAT, ACT, and state assessment scores for the past five years. And I'd just sprinkle in there, the James Lick community is amazing in that it produces everyone from Jim Plunkett, the Hall of Fame quarterback, to Khalid Hosseini, who wrote um, The Kite Runner. Um, so it's, it, it is a diverse and amazing uh, community, and the growth that we've experienced in terms of remodeling that school and attracting a new tech environment for that school ha has transformed that neighborhood in a lot of ways, which is um, very encouraging. 58% of graduates pass the English uh, college competency exam the first time as juniors, which is fantastic, especially considering the history of, of that uh, uh, school. 88% increase in GPA since 2014. 94% of the students reported feeling more connected and proud of their school versus 57% in 2014. And you can really, when you walk that campus, you can feel it. Now, I'm not saying Community Wireless did all these things, but it's a contributing factor, and it's one of those uh, builders of culture where people who are in that culture believe that they have a shot, which is something they didn't, maybe didn't used to. 91% of students stated that they are given challenging tasks in every single class, which um, in that school, uh, they, they are immersed in technology and they have access to it everywhere. If someone needs a device to take home, we provide that. Um, and, and it's a varied thing. If the student explains what kind of technology they need, we vary it up. We don't just give them one thing and say, good luck with that. Uh, the 2019 graduating class for James Lick is on track to be the most successful graduating class in James Lick student history, which is hyperbole in one regard. In the other regard, we actually have measurables that show that we have so many more kids planning to go to college, kids who are planning to go into careers, and, and kids who are very hopeful about their future, which in this day and age is a, a, maybe the most important uh, element to make sure that kids have hope. Thank you, Andy. So I uh, just want to conclude uh, just our next steps as, uh, you know, a, as I stated earlier when I did the roadmap update that uh, city and um, Eastside Union High School District, we are moving forward in um, the installation at the next phase at Overfeld High School. Uh, we are, um, the district has agreed to provide funding for the design installation and up to year three uh, for the maintenance uh, for this. And then uh, we are gonna go to uh, council in October, first mm -hmm. week, uh, to um, authorize Smart Wave so that they can start the implementation process. Our goal is definitely before next year's school um, cycle that we have this oper operating and ready to go. Um, and then we are gonna come back to the committee um, uh, just to provide an update on our community Wi-Fi strategy. That was one of the projects that were identified on the roadmap and so, um, uh, and why it's green. So we have some good things to say. And then uh, the library is, um, I, I do wanna acknowledge the library has been very proactive in initiating its first ever um, uh, digital literacy quality standards and they will be going to council um, in the spring of 2020. And then uh, as, as we are trying to figure out the long-term maintenance of this, uh, you know, the city and the district are working very closely and figuring out ways as to how we can provide additional funding for the third phase, which is at Herba Buena, and then also the ongoing maintenance support so that um, we don't uh, take all the money out of Rob's uh, department, you know, and figure out ways to make it sustainable and make it uh, ensure that we continue to provide this service. <laughs> so uh, that concludes my presentation, and I'll pass it to Dolan. Yeah, so I think the only things, if we can go back one slide, uh, um, I'll give you a little preview. So, so obviously, Mayor, as, as, as you're aware, as much as anyone, we have um, uh, a sustainability with our Wi-Fi in general, whether it be the, the five years of, of operations and maintenance with, with Eastside or just wickedly fast <laughs> downtown or Terragraph. So, so the good news is, is we have we have developed and issued the RFI. Uh, to attract a public-private partnership uh, on uh, options for a sustainable revenue stream, and that's been issued, and we'll be concluding that in the next couple of weeks and seeing what options present themselves, and hopefully we're keeping our fingers crossed that we'll find, um, you know, the, the fact that there is interest and there is a value proposition, and we may move on to an RFP, or if only one 
there's only one person that only one company that's interested in engaging then we'll, we'll see where we go from there but we're finally getting got that rfi out the door to find out is there a public private partnership that will sustain this um, revenue stream for the students and the non-student households and the people downtown great so thanks. with that we conclude our report well thanks i know we're up against the hour so i just want to say quickly thank you rajan thanks to everybody on the team thank you randy for the partnership side uh, Al, thank you for the partnership that SmartWave has had for many years with the city on several different projects. Really appreciate um, your team's work on this. Uh, and I'm very excited about this because I think this, uh, the main discrete projects that we have and we constantly talk about, this may be the most important. Is this, uh, this is so vitally critical to everything we're trying to accomplish. So thank you. Uh, Councilman Jimenez. Had a I had a question and then just to make a comment. The question is uh, wh when we're evaluating the RFI or the eventual RFP, the public-private partnership, uh, does that include this, you know, when I'm thinking public, certainly the city, but are we gonna involve the school district uh, in, in that conversation or be part of the panel or? or yeah, yeah, I mean, yes, Randy and, and Chris Funk and I actually interact from time to time and I actually think that's a good idea as we actually evaluate them to uh, to include the district on that evaluation panel. So I think that's a great idea. Okay, very good. And, and another question just came to mind real quick is, is how, does, how does the speed of this network compare to the wickedly fast Wi-Fi that we have here? <laughs> and I ask that because it's wickedly slow, not fast. <laughs> and so, so, so I'm curious as to the speed of it is it, it, it sort of facilitates more usage and such. As the customer, we're completely happy. Wonderful, okay. Very good, very good. <laughs> well, let me just say with this comment. You know, I, I grew up in East San Jose attending some of the, Yeah, <laughs> we can And I grew up, grew up attending some of the East Side schools, uh, or the, an East Side high school. Um, and I remember the way we accessed the internet were through those promo AOL sort of disks, and they gave us temporary access. You had to wait 10 minutes to log on. And, and uh, I didn't realize it at the time, but, but that essentially was the, the the entrance to the world at your fingertips, and that might have been someone's slogan. I don't remember why that stands out to me, but uh, but I think this is very meaningful. And I and and as I know happens with our cell phones, that you are really opening the world to these kids that often don't uh, don't have the resources. So I, I very much appreciate it because I could have easily be one of those kids. So thank you for all the work. I think this is a very impactful project, and look forward to seeing how it develops. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're on to the open forum. Mr. Beekman, and thanks again to everybody. Hi, uh, thank you, Mayor, for your words about uh, wanting to work with the community uh, for the future of privacy policy and uh, just your, your, your talk about it. In fact, everyone's talk about uh, your work with the community on privacy policy issues is, uh, is nice. It's, it's really nice to hear, so thank you. Um, I, I had a short speech that I wanted to speak about. Uh, the, future of, uh, the future of San Jose privacy policy is a work in progress. We may, may still not know how to answer the day-to-day -day accountability uh, and openness uh, issues with tech. Thank you for wanting to address that and work on it. As, uh, as, it, as tech is often considered quickly changing and ever evolving, the love of good accountability with tech privacy policies should be able to work as both a constant and also to be able to move, shift, and evolve as tech itself can. For all early accounting needs, I hope the time can be found for the Measure T public oversight process to be a place as a good early bridge to, be, uh, to, to the future of a better technology, public oversight and accountability practices in San Jose. I thank you again to the important work of Victor Sin and to the San Jose uh, Working Group Committees for the future of technology accountability. We are in an interesting time in San Jose. Uh, I, I hope, uh, with this interesting time that we, we can be open-minded to contribute, help, and want to contribute to good positive development of community accountability uh, in the next few years. And that with a simple positiveness, this can actually be very hopeful in what we can actually be working towards in the next few years. So again, a good luck to all of us to just having a positive attitude in, in what we can develop and uh, a learning from our mistakes approach 
And uh, this time, uh, hopefully something nice can really happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, everyone. I uh, really appreciate this. Uh, before we adjourn, I just want to point out, we've got a couple new members on our team, I think, since the last Smart City Committee. Uh, I know Porva just joined us, uh, and Porva is a Harvard Business Fellow. I'm going to get that the title wrong, uh, but came from Harvard Business. Thank you very much for joining us, Porva, and I think uh, many of the folks uh, on, on Kip and Dolan's team I know have already had an opportunity to interact, and Kaylana as well. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, and I'm going to get this wrong, Kaylana, from Stanford? Got it. Whew. Okay, can't mix those two up or you get in big trouble. <laughs> anyway, we're thrilled to have them, uh, and they're working hard on all these policies with us. Thank you all. Have a great day.